Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning. I'm so grateful to you all for coming. Thank you so much. I'm Dr. Jane Healy. I'm a principal academic, which is slightly higher than a lecturer, but not as important as a professor uh, here at Bournemouth University. And I'm a member of the British Society of Criminology's Hate Crime Network, which are organising this event today. So I'm just a little part of it. But because it's at Bournemouth, I'm kind of the central cog that everything is running around and spinning around. So I'm going to be in and out today helping Joe, my colleague who you will have met at the reception desk. And I'm also joined by a lovely friend, David Wilkin here and Ashton Kingman, who are also members of the network and who will be chairing some of the sessions today and you'll get to know during the course of today. I am going to pass you over, and it, it will work, uh, to our chair of the network, Irene, who's going to welcome you all and talk a little bit about why we've organised this. But I am required to run through this fun list of housekeeping activities with you first. Before I do, it's just to say this is called an owl. And this is recording the sessions today. Now, it's very sensitive microphone and it will pick up people's comments. If you're talking and murmuring in the room, it might pick that up. So you might want to bear that in mind. Don't go, oh, God, this is boring because we will pick it up and it won't be boring. OK, <laughs> so the owl is running and recording. And at the end of the day we're, or tomorrow, we'll be asking the speakers if they're happy for us to share those recordings with with you and with the other 50 or 60 people who signed up for today as well. So that's running. Um, I have to be clear about the fire exits. Should a fire happen, there is no uh, test on the fire alarms today. So if the fire alarm goes off, we are all to proceed either through that fire exit over there with the green sign or down the stairs if we're over on the other side of the building, down the stairs, out the front of the building to the bus stop on the left. That is our meeting point if there is a fire. I have been evacuated a few times from this building, so never been a fire, but it has gone off. So follow the fire exits and follow us. And if anybody needs additional assistance, please let myself or Joe know at reception and we'll make sure that happens for you. OK, COVID safety. You are very welcome to wear a mask if you feel comfortable, more than welcome to. And I'm assuming anyone who's got any symptoms is not here in the first place. And if you do develop COVID within 24 or 48 hours of this conference, I'd be really grateful if you'd let me know so I can let the other participants know that they might be at risk. I've had it twice, so I'm okay at the moment. Uh, refreshments, you would have had tea and coffee and pastries this morning. Um, they will be replenished at about half past one today as well. So please help yourself, tea, coffee, water, pastries and so on. Um, if you need anything else, please do let us know. Um, I'm afraid we don't have a budget for lunch for everyone, but we do have lots of leftover pastries. So if that fills the gap, that's great. Um, if you'd like to buy lunch, if you go downstairs and out the front, there's a Costa, I think, right next door, one of those coffee shops. And then right next to that, there's a Tesco. You're welcome. We have this whole floor. So you're welcome to have your lunch, come back up here, use one of the rooms or the tables, or you're welcome to use the seating area on the ground floor to have your lunch and then come back up when you're ready. So please do whatever feels best. I would ask just in, just to be careful of allergies that no one eats in here. I think the risk is very low because we're quite spread out, but just to be mindful if someone does have an allergy that you perhaps eat in one of the other rooms or downstairs, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, our speakers, we have got a sandwich for you guys to say thank you. <laughs> so uh, facilities are on the ground floor. That's the reception desk. There's also an additional security person on the ground floor. Um, should we need them? I don't think we do, but it's just to reassure anyone who might have concerns. And then timings I'm going to run through the day in a moment because we've had a couple of adjustments to the agenda for the day. I'll cover that in a second. I would ask that we keep phones on silent during the presentations and the talks, but you're very welcome. I put here social media. You're very welcome to tag some of the speakers or the, the topics that we're covering today. 
This is our network's Twitter account that we use in our British Society of Criminology Hate Crime Network, which is a bit of a mouthful. So it's BSCHCM. And this is the hashtag for the conference today, which is BSCHCConf 2023. Even more of a mouthful. Martin. It's, uh, it's I haven't done the internet. Would you like to? Yeah, if you search for um, underscore the fact. Just yeah. So for those who didn't hear, if you want to use the internet in the building, you just look for underscore the cloud and you should have access to the internet in the building today as well. Fantastic. Confidentiality. I just wanted to mention that some people today will be sharing their own lived experiences. And I think we're all mature enough to be respectful of those and to be mindful of what we may or may not share outside of this room, depending on what our speaker's preferences are. So I'd ask you to, to just be mindful of one another, uh, which I'm sure you will do because you're all lovely people, right? That's why we're here. That's why the network is so amazing. It's full of lovely people. So. We have got, and ahead of the conference, we had got a competition from our PhD students to submit a poster about transgender hate crimes. And that poster is displayed at where the tea and coffee is. And I'm delighted to say that my PhD student, and I wasn't on the panel that chose it, <laughs> my, my own PhD student, Amrit Singh, won the competition and won the award. And it's quite a detailed poster, as you can see. He is looking at the impact of LGBT plus representation in mock juries. I'll read it all. And mock jury bias and guilty verdicts in transphobic hate crime cases. So he's looking at the legal system in response to transphobic hate crime cases. You might want to have a read, James, I'm sure. <laughs> he's got quite a lot in there of what he's done so far. Um, and he's got more to do. Unfortunately, Amrit had surgery last week, uh, so he can't be with us today, but I am delighted to congratulate him and say, well done. And there was no, I was not involved. You can vouch for me. I was not involved in this decision <laughs> at all. Okay, so I'm going to briefly run through our agenda. Uh, just minimize that so we can see it. I'm going to pass you over to Irene in a moment and Rachel's here as well to welcome you formally to today. After that, Jack's perfect timing. Jack, <laughs> Jack is going to be do our plenary session. Jack is going to be talking about rethinking transphobia in the UK, what's wrong with rights. And David is going to be chairing that for about 40 minutes. So you'll have an opportunity for questions if you have some. Then we'll have our first panel. We've got James and Beth and Ricky all sitting together in the corner there, uh, who are going to talk about transphobic hate crime in the criminal justice system. Now, we initially also had a wonderful colleague, Ben Colliver, who's PhD is in transgender hate crimes, uh, was going to join you, but unfortunately he's had bereavement. Uh, so he can't be with us, but we have got one of my colleagues, Jane Caldwell, who's a professor of sociology here and has done a lovely project on swimming for trans communities. Some of you know Jane, I think some of you have been part of that. She has put her artwork here on display for you to have a look at. She's going to talk a bit about the artwork and the project in place of Ben. Then we'll have a break uh, for lunch. And during the lunch, we had information tables from different organizations, but I think some people said, we forgot our stuff. So, uh, but you're more than welcome to just go and have a chat in the break room where the tea and coffee is. You'll also be able to see Amrick's poster there and Jane's artwork here, and we can move some of it there as well, if you'd like to. So that's a bit to get to know one another. And we're a nice group today. You can all, you've already been making friends over Danish pastries, I think. So you'll get to, to know one another in that break. Then this afternoon, we have another panel at two o'clock, which Ashton is chairing. And we've got Maximilian from Beyond Reflections, who hasn't arrived yet, but is on the way. And Beth and Charity. And unfortunately, Marcus Gray is taken ill, so he won't be joining us today. So that will be a slightly shorter panel. If anybody's here and wants to talk, please let us know. We'd be happy to see if we can fit you in in that space. And then at three o'clock, 
our last panel, which David is chairing, and we've got Katie McBride, who's on her way from Plymouth at the moment, and Gina Gwenfrey. Gina is joining us online to present her talk. And then we've got Jay and Orlando, who are going to do a little Q&A session here about the lived experiences uh, that Jay has had and Jay's work that he does with training social work students. So that's going to be fantastic. And then at four o'clock, we hopefully will have a reconvening in here and a bit of a discussion about main themes of the day, questions that have emerged on the day, anything else that people want to contribute that's open to you at that time before we close. I have got a Padlet page, uh, which if you are QR code friendly, you can, I'm just seeing if I can move my, there we go. So the Padlet page is open. You can either follow that link that's up there, BU Padlet is quite long winded. So come and find me. Or if you click on the QR code, you can post questions about any of the topics today. And I will then bring the questions back in at four o'clock. So if you're feeling a little shy and you don't want to ask questions in a session or we run out of time, you're very welcome to post them on that Padlet and we'll bring up that screen at four o'clock and, and look at those. One of the attenders who couldn't make it today uh, has already sent me a question that they wanted to cover, so that's already up there. But I'm more than happy to give you the link if you come and speak to me today. I know it's a bit long-winded there. <laughs> so I think that is it for me. We'll come back to that one later. And I'm going to stop sharing and I'm going to pass you over to Irene. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the BSC Hate Crime Network Conference. My name is Irene Zempi. I am the chair of the Hate Crime Network. And I'm pleased that we also have Rachel Keeley, our uh, deputy chair, with us. Um, Rachel, do you want to say hi? Your slides are not coming up, bear with. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. No, no, that's okay. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll introduce myself while you're figuring out the tech. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Rachel Keithley. I use she, they pronouns. I'm very sorry I can't be there today. I'm up in uh, sunny Yorkshire, um, but I'm there with you in spirit. Uh, yeah. I am the vice chair of the network, as Irene said, and my research background is in LGBTQ plus online hate as well. So I hope you have a very rewarding and empowering uh, session and conference today. That's lovely. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, it's working. It's working, Jane. Thank you yeah. so much. Um, so transphobic hate crime is a very timely and important topic. And this is why we decided to focus on this type of hate crime uh, this year. The network stands in solidarity with the trans community. And an attack upon the trans community is an attack on all of us. We are pleased to organize uh, a conference on this topic with the support of the British Society of Criminology and also Bournemouth University. Uh, just a little bit of information about the network. The Hate Crime Network was organized. It was set up in 2018. And for this conference and also other events and activities that we organize, the network aims to provide a forum and share information and experiences about hate crime with a view to developing critical analysis and debate across uh, research, policy and practice. Also to advance understanding of hate crime both in the UK and globally to foster opportunities for collaboration amongst hate crime researchers, criminologists, uh, and also related individuals and groups, and also to encourage networking between academics, researchers, practitioners, policymakers, and students interested in the field of hate crime. Uh, next slide, please. Hold on. <laughs> there we go. Thank you. Uh, some of the network events and activities that we organize include our previous conferences, including misogyny and hate crime at Nottingham Trent University in 2019, hate crime in football in 2021, and that was online because of the pandemic, 
and disability hate crime in 2022 at the University of Leicester. We also organize our online postgraduate and early career researcher events, which are chaired by Leah Birch and David Wilkin with a fantastic lineup of speakers. These are recorded, so you can catch up uh, with these in your own time. Also, we have our amazing podcasts. Uh, some recent episodes include a podcast with Dr. Neville Lawrence, uh, also with the National Holocaust Center and the Sophie Lancaster Foundation. These are the most recent podcasts, as well as our online writing groups that Rachel Keeley and Mikhail Azad are leading. And also our Sophie and, Lancaster, Sophie and Sylvia Lancaster Prize, which is sponsored by Palgrave, and the prize is dedicated to the memory of Sophie and Sylvia Lancaster. And finally, our poster competition, the winner of which will be, well, it, um, it was announced earlier today, but hopefully you will be um, engaging with a poster uh, later on in the day. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> Uh, so thank you, it's working. So do stay in touch. Uh, membership to the network is free and it is open to anyone with an interest in the field of hate crime. More information about the network and all of the events that we organize, all the activities that we um, organize can be found on the website. As I said, many of the uh, conferences, the um, uh, podcasts, the early career researcher uh, groups, these are recorded so you can catch up in your own time. We also have a newsletter that we um, share every three months so you can catch up with the network news through our social media and on social media we are on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram so uh, do follow us um, and also our disk mail list and you can subscribe here. If you have any questions about the network, please feel free to contact us via the network's email or myself and Rachel are happy to answer any questions you might have or opportunities for collaboration or ideas for events and um, activities. Um, I am very, very sorry that I can't be with you today. Um, I would like to say a massive thank you as a final point to our amazing um, conference organizing team. That's Jane Healy, David Wilkin, Ben Culver, and also Ashton Kington for helping today. Thank you so, so much. I also want to say a big thank you to the British Society of Criminology and also Bournemouth University for supporting the event and also the staff at the university for working on the event on top of their existing workload. And finally, last but not least, a thank you to our fabulous speakers and attendees. We hope that you enjoy the event and you find it useful. Uh, that's that from me. Rachel, would you like to add anything? Um, no, I think you covered everything. Just to reiterate a massive thank you to the organisers and the speakers who've given up their time today and for everyone else who's attending as well. Thank you very much for supporting the network and uh, supporting what is a really important and personal topic. I've been uh, teaching and tutoring people since 1993. Um, we, and I know you're all looking at me thinking, well, I must have started wheeling young. And you're right. Um, but I, I've been doing that in different guises. But I remember I was teaching a course in the early noughties uh, to a group of people. And the, the subject matter was intelligence and surveillance and that kind of stuff. And it was a month long course. One of the delegates was Julia, who was transitioning. And we were about halfway into the course and she came uh, in that morning. She always came in quite early, just after eight o'clock, covered in bruises. And did the usual kind of thing, you know, a bit of uh, humanity, offered help, offered to call the police, uh, offered guidance, offered pastoral care, offered to, if she wanted to, be removed from the course and put onto another one. But she didn't want any of that. She wanted to finish the course and she was steadfast in wanting to finish that course and good luck to her and she did 
Uh, but when I would said to her about calling the police, you know, we should record these crimes, she said, what's the point? This has happened so many times. This isn't the first time. And it won't be the last. And that was 20 years ago. And it so moved me that I wanted to mention it here today. Julia isn't her real name to protect her. Uh, to quote uh, a, a phrase, perhaps badly, from Mark Walter's recent book, hate crime is more than the sum of its parts. It's not just an episode of banter. It's not just a, oh, it's a bit of a giggle, mate, bit of a laugh, you know, I'm not saying the humour. It's not just uh, another sordid attempt to take away some of your character that I put up with for between eight and ten years when I was a kid. So it's a very important issue, and I'm very pleased we've got with us today. Jack Lopez has travelled all the way from Bradford. Well done for that. They've let me out. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Jack has done much research in, in reproductive health and in sexual health um, in, in trans people during the pandemic and works for a couple of organisations which support and fund uh, typical research in that area. So from Bradford, please, Jack, it's your shot. Thank you. Thank you. Scared about shouting now? Will I scare the owl? That's no, the right. owl's okay. the owl's sleeping. I'll do my best. For um, thanks, um, thanks for inviting me. And hello, good morning, everybody. I'm just going to settle my nerves by doing some terrible dad jokes as we begin. <laughs> um, I will say right at the beginning of this. Unfortunately, I have to leave just after lunch today and can't be around for this afternoon. So, if you want to speak to me about anything. My favourite colours, birthday cake, anything in the speech whatsoever, do come and find me in the break, do speak to me in the lunchtime. I'm on a 24 hour pass out of the north. <laughs> if I don't get back in time, I will lose my credentials <laughs> and they won't serve me in the local fish and chip shop. Um, so, yeah. As it says on the screen, I'm da um, Dr. Jack Lopez. I'm Associate Dean for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion in the University of Bradford in the Faculty of Management Law and Social Sciences. So this is where our sociology and criminology department sits, our social work department sits. I'm a medical and social anthropologist, and I'm also about 100 years ago um, a social worker, originally by profession and was a social work academic as well. I do a lot um, and it's only been over the last 18 months when I got my diagnosis of ADHD that I realised when I look at my CV, that is the reason why I am very much um, jack of all trades and master of quite a few actually, <laughs> but it's really good and I'm also incredibly proud of the fact that I am the first openly queer and trans senior management person at my university. And I say that very proudly because it doesn't happen a lot in academia. And I do often, I do often joke that I literally had to transition into a middle-aged white man in order to get promoted. <laughs> that is exactly what happened. But it's great. I do not take this responsibility lightly. I show myself to my students and my staff on a daily basis. It can get very tiring, but when those people come to me because they've seen me and they've seen that people like us can survive but not only survive we can have careers we grow we can be successful that is what makes it worth it when i go home tired at the end of the day so i spent a long time thinking about how to approach this paper beginning with the most basic question how did we get here you know, similar to the tale you were, you were saying in the early 1990s, we're still here. Why are we in the year 2023 having a conference addressing the very fact of why a relatively small population are dehumanised on a daily basis by the state, the healthcare system, the education system, the media, the legislative process, religious institutions, and ultimately, some individuals purely for the crime of existing. When I reread this opening paragraph, I could actually be talking about any minoritized community. In fact, we often pose a response to the verbal or written attacks on trans plus people by saying, what if we replace the word trans with disabled, black, Muslim, indigenous, Jewish, or gay, 
in order to highlight the targeting of trans plus people as disproportionate and hypocritical. In order to show that where we have supposedly won the discrimination argument against other identities, we are yet to accept those beyond a cis heteronormative existence as human. Moreover, why are we able to employ this reasoning to counter discriminatory statements against the trans plus, plus populations? Because at some point in very recent history, nothing pre 20th century, if you to research it, the concept of human rights as a unifying framework to protect and uplift specific individual or collective identities has been hard fought and supposedly won by many of the aforementioned populations and their allies. By having fought for and had enshrined in international and national tools of government, those people who've been humanized, have been humanized, been awarded human status by other humans who ultimately hold the power to say who or who cannot be human. Yet, as we see consistently across the world, country-specific human rights are derivative. They can be removed on a whim by those who bestow them. They can also evolve, and as a concept, they can be manipulated to divide and conquer. In my classrooms, I often explore the question of human rights with my students. We ask whether as a framework and a legal function, have they in any way eradicated discrimination? Clearly not. Otherwise, we would have outlived their purpose by now. And ultimately, what would a world look like without them? The risk of eradication, permanent precarity and fragile state of hard-won rights is a fantastic tool of distraction for those that hold the actual institutional power. So since 2018, the trans plus communities and their allies have been very much focused on spreading the message that trans rights are human rights. I'm aware that this phrase predates 2018, but I'm using 2018 as a key marker in this speech because it's really where we see things ramping up in terms of attacks against trans plus people. So in an attempt to win support and empathy from the rest of humanity, we take to the streets, we go online and we scream and we shout, trans rights are human rights in a way that sounds like we are desperately begging to be seen and respected. The rapid and confusing discourse over reviews and amendments to legislation have sent the trans plus community and allies into defensive mode and appear to have turned all manner of political commentator and internet warrior into a supposed expert in the law. I have lost count of the amount of times I've seen people on the television, the radio, supposed professionals, even legal professionals misinterpret the Equality Act continuously. Hours of mass and social media output are devoted to debating legislation that most citizens barely even knew existed before. Whilst at the same time, without any amendments actually happening as of yet, the trans plus community have been left with a barely functioning public healthcare system. So for those of you who don't know, this means that adults wishing to undergo um, gender affirming medical care are now on a pathway. The last piece of research that I did with Transactual, we calculated that it will now take between six to 15 years for a person to transition on the NHS. Um, and that's the basis of being getting seen and being, being uh, able to obtain all the surgery that they need. Under 18s with a wait list currently of over 7,000 young people also now have no functioning service to speak of. There's a 56% rise between 2018 and 2022 in reported hate crime. Um, and there is also a piece of um, research done on employment in 2021 showed that now, compared to 2016, 65% of trans plus adults are more likely to hide their identity in the workplace where they're able to. They're also dispro disproportionately impacted by homelessness, educational barriers and other financial insecurities, are statistically more likely to have a combination of poor physical and mental health resulting in lifelong disabilities. So as I started to go down this rabbit hole, my quest to write this paper 
actually became about not asking how did we get here in terms of transphobia, because any of us who've ever attempted to have a conversation of people who are very much committed to those views will know that no logic occurs and we will go around in circles. So I'm not even going to go there. Instead, we have to become... Instead, why have we become so focused on preserving the few rights bestowed upon the trans plus population in the UK as some kind of path to humanisation and peaceful existence? And should we really be focusing on what this is distracting us from? And how can change be more revolutionary, less bureaucratic and driven by liberatory arguments centred on joy, human connection and coexistence? Asking how did we get here will tie us in so many knots. It makes us feel so overwhelmed that we feel paralysed and we run away from finding solutions. And I say this as an academic whose days are devoted to thinking about how did we get here. The paralysis is real. Sometimes we have to meet the world where we're at and instigate change from there. The issue of transphobia and its connection to hate crime is not unique. I mean, no shade to my people at all, but there isn't actually anything specifically special about trans people. The issue is about the history of anything that has ever challenged the global minority yet dominant power of white supremacist cis heteronormative imperialism. The white supremacist cis heteronormative imperialist structures that so, sex, so successfully dominate our interconnected world thrive off a lack of intersectionality and hyper categorization. We can separate a continuing rise in transphobic hate crime from other types, however, by the impact of this accepted dehumanization on the basis of gender identity and the legacy of pathologizing gender along with human sexuality. Now, although I've said my intention today is not to explore, um, to, is not to explore the question, how did we get here, but to reflect on the current strategies to trans plus protections, I acknowledge that we do need a bit of a brief overview because I'm not sure how familiar people are with the subject and the key political economic factors that have led us here today. So I have a definition of transphobia and I, prefer to put it in an all-encompassing way as, as we can read up here, discrimination against any human being on the basis of them being or being perceived as transgender, occurring overtly and directly as a form of violence towards an individual or group of people. But it can only do so because it's enabled by structural and systemic inequalities brought about by a combination of social history, politics, capitalist <coughs> economics, collective trauma or irrational fear of another group of people. I apologize as an anthropologist, we don't do short sentences. <laughs> <laughs> so without going into much more detail, the definition I write here actually does touch on how we got here. It's all here in the bit at the bottom. We are here as a consequence of history. European colonization of the mind, bodies, and geographies, and of course, neoliberal capitalism. White supremacist cis heteronormative imperialism is a highly successful ideology. Successful because it took a global minority to create a dominant worldview of what it means to be an acceptable human. The definition of the norm as it was created by a global minority has within it a highly restricted version of what it means to be a good human, a citizen of the state. And anything outside of that limited description falls foul to claims of the unnatural, to dangerous, to dehumanization. Despite this narrow ideal of what makes a good citizen, the rest of humanity persists to exist. We don't go anywhere, we're still here. If anything, visibility of minoritized populations increases year by year. In 2021, we had the first census attempts to collect a broader range of sexual orientation and gender data. Though it's had its fair share of critiques from all camps, publication of this data does give us a conservative estimate of the gender landscape across the UK for the time being. Now, according to England and Wales census data, around 262,000 people in England and Wales, that's kind of 0.5% of the population, said their gender identity and sex registered at birth were different. 
Now, not all of those 262,000 people identified explicitly as transgender, and there are multiple reasons as to why this is the case. But around, four, I'm very suspicious I'm a, of these numbers I'm about to say, because they're very, very equal. Um, around 48,000 people gave their identity as trans man. And weirdly enough, another 48 thousand people gave their identity as trans woman it's almost like we had a secret meeting before <laughs> and decided we're just going to go 50 50 on this so there are, that's about 1.1 uh, percent of the population together so um, about 118,000 did not provide a write-in response at all, um, and a further 30,000 identified as non-binary, and 18,000 wrote in a completely different gender identity as well. So ultimately, in England and Wales, at least we are still only focusing here on around 0.2% of the population over 16, a teeny weeny tiny subpopulation, and in a purely binary context, pretty much reflecting, you know, in this 50-50 element, pretty much reflecting the cis population of, of, of men and women, how we go as well. So within the 2021 census, being the first of its kind in the UK for all UK countries, and I apologize for anybody from further north in Scotland that I haven't brought those stats in, um, to attempt to collect data on gender identity beyond the cis binary, it's difficult to have a chronological comparison. We can't compare yet because we don't have that data. Up to this point, there's only been NHS records and the respondents to trusted LGBTQ NGO surveys to reflect the population. But what we do know from the various surveys and the census is that the trans, po um, the trans plus population is becoming more visible and that visibility is translated to a perceived growth in population. Now, I don't buy into this. There's more, there's more, there's more. It's about visibility. It's not about a huge increase. We've always been here. It's just that nobody's asked us. Nobody's wanted to count us, or we haven't been willing to say. So studies of media discourse, along with global trends, there's a hike in negative and defamatory articles in the mainstream press since 2018. Just go back to that one there. So a study carried out by Professor Paul Baker at Lancaster University found that the UK press wrote over 6,000 articles about trans people just in the years 2018 to 19. 6,000. Overall, the research found that there were three and a half times as many trans hostile articles between 2018 and 19 compared to 2012, and that the mentions of transgender children were 23 times as common in 2018 to 19 compared to 2012. So this rhetoric of what we find and what has happened recently in terms of this very scary new guidance that's coming out particularly for secondary schools it should not be a surprise to anybody this has been happening for years now fast forward to 2022 and the number of articles published in the uk news media and this is excluding lgbtq plus media on trans topics was 501 in the month of may alone so that's over 16 articles a day. Leader of this trend in the UK, to no surprise whatsoever, was the Daily Mail, whose average during the same month of May was just over five articles per day, online and in print. Such constant media attention on any tiny population has connection to various court cases, debates over the Gender Recognition Act amendments, prolific misinterpreting of the Equality Act, misinformation and non-evidence claims in the mainstream media have even influenced parliamentary debates and have led to bizarre leading questions around election activity about what a woman is, rather than what are your policies around poverty, education, housing, migration, climate change, and essentially, why are you effing up this country? So between the mainstream news and poorly regulated social media platforms, the state and admittedly academia, there has emerged a false argument around women particularly and competing versions of feminism. A resurgence of the 1980s separatist feminist arguments that most people, 
including myself, thought we'd seen the back off as soon as we realised just how ableist, racist, xenophobic, classist and non-equality based this particular era was. I will not address this specific aspect in this paper and one could very quickly disappear down that never ending rabbit hole of non logic tying oneself in knots with contradictions and spurious connections with far right movements, elite classes, extreme religious groups and traumatized individuals. When we delve into the politics of neoliberal political economics and the function of an oppositionality to ensure continuous confusion and fragmentation amongst populations, what we see is how in the current climate, cognitive dissonance reigns supreme. Though we could easily dismiss this unhealthy obsession with a tiny minority on the basis of no evidence whatsoever, we simply cannot because of the ways in which the obsessed individuals feed into the administrative state systems of oppression to, to the point where there are real life consequences. Aside from the obvious political manipulation of distraction, the further real threats to healthcare access, murmurings of a return to section 28 style education guidelines and tensions over the Equality Act interpretations, the increased negative attention given to trans plus lives, this estimated 0.2% of the population is actually beginning to impact on public attitudes. And the, and the part of this is resulting in an increase in report hate crime stats both officially and according to LGBTQIA plus advocacy organizations who research on non-reported hate crimes. So YouGov polls from 2022 also evidence this public change in attitude towards trans people and discrimination has changed significantly since 2018. So it's having real life consequences where previous YouGov respondents actually before 2022, respondents to YouGov polls not only were claiming not to really know about trans issues, but they were claiming that they didn't even pay attention to them. It wasn't even it, it wasn't even coming across them. They weren't thinking about trans people, and what they were doing was equating that to the feeling that there was no issues around uh, around um, trans equality in the country. And what's changed since 2022 is people are all of a sudden hyper aware but incredibly misinformed. And they have this balance of actually still not seeing it as a problem, kind of generally accepting that trans people exist and that's fine, but they are aware that it's an issue and they're actually give, starting to give kind of, um, they're giving answers that are reflecting the misinformation, that trans people exist, there might be a problem, we're okay, it's fine, we're now not sure about changing rooms, whereas before we didn't care and we didn't know and we didn't think about it. So it's really starting to kind of slip into the public mindset. So administrative violence against trans plus people in the UK is characterised actually by privilege. And it's inseparable from neoliberalism. Neoliberal societies do not trust the state to promote equality. As much as minority populations mistrust the political process of democracy, they're actually left with no, no choice. How much grassroots activism promotes writing to local MPs, signing online petitions for issues to be raised in Parliament, contributing to consultations and reviews. From grassroots activism, there is both an inherent mistrust in politicians, but also a need to trust in the democratic system to protect citizens. The liberal elites, however, have a complete mistrust in the state for different reasons and prefer to take their woes to the judiciary, who characterized by class allegiance will tend to listen to what they have to say. The neoliberal insistence upon the individual as a foundational element in political economic life opens the door to individual rights activism. So we only have to examine the cases taken to court over the last few years to see this individualism at work. We only have to. The neoliberal concern of, I was harmed, it hurt my feelings. I, I exist to believe the things I exist supersedes any social democratic concern for equality, democracy and actual social solidarities. It's individual. When we examine the cases that have gone to court, it's about the me, 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 me. I want 
And that's what it's about. The cases we've seen that have been well publicized have not been characterized on the surface by their anti-transness or hatred per se, but instead on the individual's right to a personal belief or expression or opinion. And so these cases actually become about freedom of expression and liberty over discrimination or about attacking public services providing care to the trans plus population. So all of the attacks on the NHS services in terms of young people, in terms of adults, really feed into this neoliberal agenda of privatisation and battering down the public health service. The frequent appeal to legal action accepts the neoliberal preference for appeal to judicial and executive rather than parliamentary powers. Yet what we've seen in the UK is the results of legal action then being quoted as evidence in parliamentary debates, often from the mouths of politicians who were from the very judicial elite of human rights law background themselves. Legal decisions tend to favour the individual's rights over equality and social justice. So as we've, as we've seen, even where individuals have not necessarily won their cases outright, the lack of favour to broader social justice allows them to interpret the results as a success, further bolstering and legitimising um, the oppression of their target group. This timely and costly court processes are a privilege of the liberal elite, or in the 21st century, they are a privilege of the crowd funders of the liberal elite. What's wrong with human rights discourse and equality legislation is their creation under the guise of neutrality. The practice of human rights and equality sit within administration systems that are general sites of production and implementation of racism, homophobia, xenophobia, sexism, transphobia and ableism. Whilst the people subject to these types of discrimination fight hard and make sacrifices to win the inclusion of their rights, while such privileges still sit within archaic systems, can they ever be anything more than a temporary respite from oppression? Since the, certain, since the early 1980s, we, the Global North, have been in a political economic existence that's described by anthropologist and geographer David Harvey as something called accumulation by dispossession, an existence that simultaneously produces and thrives on oppositional culture, yet one that's very hard to pin down. So Harvey explains how dispossession, as opposed to capital accumu accumulation, which thrives on a binary oppositional culture, is actually fragmented and particular by design. There's a privatisation here, an environmental degradation there. There's a financial crisis of indebtedness elsewhere. And so it's hard to oppose all this specificity and particularity without an appeal to universal principles. So what's more, dispossession entails a loss of rights by design, hence the turn to a universalistic rhetoric of rights around sustainable ecological practices. Yet this appeal to universalism is actually a double-edged sword dependent on the commitment to a one-size-fits-all approach. Universalism can work well on agreed global issues such as climate change, but its results in the area of human rights are actually quite problematic, given the diversity of political, economic circumstances and cultural practices that can be found around the world. Gender, ideas about gender, identity, being a human existing on this earth are very different depending where you live, depending what your cosmology is, your spirituality is, what your culture is, what your beliefs are. The, you can't pin it down to a universal ideal. Even the question of how we're all human in terms of what we exist as animals is different. So the idea that one identity by base rights priorities transfer directly to another is also a cause for concern. So with gender identity problematically isolated as a factor alone, the connection of trans plus people to broader LGBTQIA plus community has actually led to a piggybacking of rights discourse. And this brings me to the core contention of this paper. It's easy to fall into thinking that trans plus protections need a similar approach to the gay rights movement of the 20th century. After all, trans plus people were central to the movement in its conception, and most of the discriminatory claims against trans plus people today are a lazy rehashing of the claims used for decades towards people on the basis of not being heterosexual, protecting the children, the family ideal, going against nature, the overall degradation of society. We've heard it all before. 
Therefore, it's logical to assume that a similar path to liberation is required for gender diversity in whatever shape or form that may take. But we need to ask the question, at what point did the gay rights movement lose its path towards actual liberation to become one of assimilation? And has this assimilation in the context of the industrialized global north become the strategy through which divisions have occurred within the LGBTQ plus community itself, triggered by the fragility of heteronormative acceptance? It's become about don't rock the boat, don't look different, don't let the cis hats hate us as well. That's what it's become about. So precisely because as a collective, the LGBTQIA plus community are A, we're not all starting from the same societal marker and liberation does not come about via assimilation or in more contemporary parlance, it's become about the politics of inclusion. So at this point, I'm just going to shift to a practical focus on legal assimilation and equality law. So to paraphrase the legal scholar, Dean Spade, neoliberalism has not only shaped the larger social, economic and political conditions that trans plus people in the UK find themselves in, but it's also produced a specific lesbian and gay rights formation that the trans politics operates in relation to. So whilst focus in the social world has been on whether or not to review or amend UK equality legislation and impacting on trans plus people only how to make the gender recognition more acceptable, I'd like us to think about the limits actually of UK equality legislation and addressing them in addressing the marginalization of trans folk purely through the lens of anti-discrimination laws that bar discrimination in employment and public spaces when no other anti-discrimination legislation has actually succeeded in eradicating discrimination on the basis of any other characteristic. The aspect of individual regulation incorporated into equality legislation, what a trans plus person needs to have done or said in order to prove they are trans enough not to be discriminated against will always lead to more vulnerable individuals being excluded from protections. And we see this particularly within the groups of our population in terms of people who are gender fluid, who are non-binary and so forth. Hate crime laws are promoted under related logic. Proponents argue that trans plus people have a higher risk to overt forms of violence when recognised as trans in public spaces, including online as well as physical. There's also an argument behind inclusion in hate crime laws that they A, will act as a deterrent, and B, they will force police and prosecutors to take discrimination of this population more seriously. Additionally, proponents of anti-discrimination and hate crime laws argue that the very process of creating them, including media representation concerning the lived experience of trans plus people and communities, involvement with legislations to tell them about their lived experience actually increases positive trans visibility and advances the struggle for trans equality. However, in practice, hate crime laws are not shown to have a deterrent effect. They focus on punishment and cannot be argued to actually prevent bias motivated violence. They also show little impact for populations that have historically poor relations with the police and who are disproportionately impacted by structural violence. Similarly, anti-discrimination laws are not adequately, adequately enforced outside of an employment context People who experience discrimination are already coming from a place of economic and social marginalization. They cannot afford to go to court. So where do we go with this thinking and how do we imagine a world devoid of transphobia, a world where collective healing is paramount and our civil liberties and right to live without violence do not depend on curtailing the rights of others or going to court to prove one's legal right to discriminate against others. In terms of anti-discrimination and hate crime, we must challenge the limits of the victim-perpetrator approach. Human behaviour and contradictions are far too complex to re be reduced to a binary opposition to explain how violence comes about. If we want to understand properly and why certain people fare poorly, do not have what they need to survive and experience high levels of violence and vulnerability to premature death, 
we must examine how power operates beyond the individual discrimination approach. We must examine and be more prolific in how we use our methods of knowledge exchange to not only speak of power dynamics within systems, but to find ways to translate speech into action. We must learn to love each other as humans. Yes. Yes. Is, yes. is my ending sentence oh. on that. Well, here, here to that. Well done, guys. Pleasure to introduce our first speaker on the panel, Detective Superintendent Ricky Danda. Danda, apologies, who is the hate crime lead for Dorset Police, though has just recently moved to a new role as head of professional standards. Congratulations. He has 20 years experience in the police, including roles within teams such as firearms support, major crimes, custody office. Ricky is also chair of DEPA. Depa. Depa, which is a support association for black and minority ethnic staff in Dorset Police. He is also the current co-chair of the Prejudice Free Dorset, which is changing slightly. I don't know if you told me that. Thank you so much for being here. I will hand the floor over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and thank you very much for that introduction. That is the first time I've ever had a bio. Really? First time ever. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, I'm Ricky Dander, I'm a detective superintendent within Dorset Police, I'm also the forced hate crime lead, um, and I'm going to talk to you today about a conversation that I had with a member of the trans community and the role of our of the police service uh, within some of the experience that she faced. So what does hate crime lead mean? So basically what it means is that um, I'm in charge of the policies and procedures that our officers and staff uh, conduct on the day-to-day -day business. I get data around commission rates, so that's the level of reporting around hate crime. Um, I'm in charge of having a look at what our positive outcome rates are, so uh, when we receive a report of crime, do we get a positive outcome for that victim uh, in terms of a caution or a charge or, or a summons for the, for the offender to go to court? Uh, and I have a look at things like hotspots, uh, so do we have a time of the day when, uh, when hate crimes are perpetrated? Do we have locations? Um, which are particularly of interest to us. Uh, and then I'll work with partners to see if we could try and reduce the commission rate and increase the positive outcome rate. So that's my role. Uh, and at the same time, I'm having a look at some of our policies, making sure that they're fit for, for, fit for purpose and making sure that they're consistently applied to a high standard. So as part of that role, uh, and I've been in post for a year, uh, I conducted some research and I spoke to a member of the trans community, someone who was born as male and is transitioning into female. Uh, and the reason for this is because I don't know enough about this subject area to be able to have a look with any great detail about our policies and making sure that they are fit for purpose. Um, and I was concerned about the fact that with the commission rate, uh, so the number of people who are reporting trans hate crimes is fairly low. Um, and, I, and, I, and I think I wanted to understand the reasons behind that to be able to um do better as a service when i spoke to her um she told me about the fact that the journey of transitioning had been both liberating and crushing liberating uh, as it helped her understand her thought processes from an early age uh, and helped her understand the current uh, her current self and crushing due to the reaction of that journey that it had, had um of some people she spoke about transphobic comments uh, and taking avoiding action to prevent crimes and antisocial behaviour being committed against her. She regularly wears dresses, but in our meeting, um, she arrived in jeans and a t-shirt. And I asked her, if you regularly wear dresses, why have you decided to come in jeans and a t-shirt today? And she told me is that she didn't want to bring it upon herself. Uh, which is a bit of a sad indictment as to where we are as a society at the moment. She says that when she does have the courage to be her true self, she walks with a phone in her hand and is on the phone to Samaritans in order to get support. She told me of a mental health crisis within the trans community that led to elevated levels of self-harm and suicide due to confidence, self-esteem and self-worth being eroded. She spoke of a 50% uh, figure within the USA uh, of trans youth having considered self-harm. And as a police officer, whose primary duty is to protect the public, um, that again is a shocking figure. 
She mentioned her education and workplace experiences where some people had been helpful, but that many others were transphobic and that there was a lack of support. She told me that she had jumped between jobs due to unsafe environments where comments made made her feel awful. She mentioned the role of government and the media whose rhetoric and policies were fueling transphobia. And she used a bathroom ban as an example. And then we moved on to policing uh, and her view of policing. And she told me uh, quite, quite succinctly that uh, she feels that policing doesn't take this type of hate crime seriously. She told me that there was a lack of understanding on behalf of our officers and staff, that there was a lack of trust coming from the community. She said that there was a lack of repercussions uh, and a feeling that the justice community is failing the community, justice system, sorry, is failing the community. She said that some of the languages, language used and methods used were hurtful. Um, and that there was a lack of respect for pronouns. So just some real basic stuff that we could do that would elevate the levels of respect, trust and confidence within the community, we're not doing. She said that those barriers will continue to prevent reporting until officers start respecting individuals and the community. Uh, she spoke about a requirement for education and sensitivity training, and that we need to treat people with empathy and compassion. She said that community outreach was required to connect and we need to involve the community in order to help inform policing policy and decisions moving forward. And she also said that we needed to provide more information on how to report crimes because people didn't really understand how to do that. So what this alludes to to me is that there's members of the trans community that feel physically and psychologically unsafe. Uh, and that's a situation which is simply unacceptable to me. I'm a member of the BME community, and much of what I had heard in, during the course of that conversation really resonated with me. The feelings of being judged for being different, from being excluded and persecuted, to being harassed and victimized, to having opportunities taken away and policies written which seemingly discriminated against certain people and individuals. It all struck a very familiar tone with me. And her perceptions around police failings are evident in the data that is captured in our system. So if we have a look here, transgender hate crimes, last year with just 27 crimes reported, 21 to 22. The positive outcome rate, so of those 27 crimes, is 7.4%. So only 7.4% of those crimes received a positive outcome, so either a caution or some form of community resolution or a charge. The following year, there has been a slight increase uh, in terms of numbers. So 43, that represents a 59% increase. But for me, it is scratching on the surface at the very best. The positive outcome rate dropped to 7%. And of those, in terms of locations where they occurred, 13 offences occurred in Bournemouth and 8 in Wenman. So in comparison, in the same kind of time frame last year, 170 racially and religiously aggravated crimes were reported with a positive outcome rate of 23%. So more trust and confidence uh, in, in the black and brown community uh, and a better level of service from the police when that occurs. It all signifi signifies under-reporting to me. Um, uh, and the positive outcome rate signifies that when a victim does come forward, we are not able to achieve a positive outcome rate for them, a positive outcome for them on enough occasions. Now, this could be down to a multitude of reasons, but given the testimony that I had heard firsthand, I have to assess it's partly due to the fact that our collective response as a policing organisation is not at the level that either I or you would want. But we know that we have work to do, and what I can tell you is that Dorset Police is committed to improving its offer to the trans community. But at this time, we are conducting a training needs assessment to ensure that our staff are equipped to deliver a service that is fair and equitable to all. And what that means is that we're going to be reaching out to the community to understand what should be included in this package, how should it be delivered, um, who needs to be delivering it, um, because it shouldn't be me. I don't have the lived experience to be able to speak. We've recently concluded the delivery of a standards and ethics conference to all of our first and second line managers and the senior team focused on ethical leadership and reaffirming standards of professional behaviour. 
the stories that I hear around you know, incidents whereby people feel that we're not treating the trans community and other protected characteristics, characteristics with the trust and respect that they deserve, um, simply not good enough. Uh, and we have reaffirmed the standard that we expect from our staff during the course of those presentations. We're reviewing our policies and procedures to make sure that they are fit for purpose. Um, we're developing independent advisory groups with members of the community so that they can help us in making sure those policies are accurate, fair and equitable. We've launched an EDI strategy that focuses on four pillars. So making sure uh, that we represent our officers, that our staff and officers are represented, uh, that we offer respect, um, that we have people involved during the decision making processes uh, and that people are protected when they come to us and when they work for us as well. Uh, I've spoken a little bit about IAGs, but establishing an independent scrutiny forum will provide transparent examination of the use of our police powers and will include complaints. Um, we will act upon scrutiny and challenge to improve, learn and to drive up standards. Also, I'm the new head of professional standards, as I discussed earlier, which will proactively investigate any reported cases of misconduct or criminality by our officers and staff volunteers with transparency and integrity. The work of my team ensures robust investigations of complaints and allegations, which with outcomes ranging from misconduct sanctions to dismissal. And you may well have seen recently that there was a case in the papers involving five of our officers who were found guilty of gross misconduct due to them being part of a WhatsApp group which, which had sexist, misogynistic, tra tra um, homophobic and, and racist comments uh, and um, imagery on that WhatsApp group. We've got a lot of work to do, but I hope that we've demonstrated our commitment to getting this right so that our, fair, our service is fair, accessible and equitable to all. Finally, I think uh, my new role means that I report directly to the Deputy Chief Constable, Sam Dorea. She is the second highest ranking officer in the entire force, a powerful, kind and compassionate leader and her daughter is Anna Dorea. She's the lady I spoke to as part of this research. I state this only to demonstrate that our collective vision for what Dorset Police stands for is infused with lived experience, and then we are committed to improving our service. Thank you. Adam, you were perfectly on time. That's very impressive. Yeah, thank you. Oh, yeah. so we're going to have the next speakers and then question. Okay. Yes. Yeah. You ready? Next speakers. Well, Ricky has brought that in on time so perfectly that he's put me under immense pressure. And I know that I could <laughs> no, talk right for England. <laughs> so I've actually just set myself a stopwatch. So uh, see, see that's, that's, that's fancy. Um, yeah. Colleague, you uh, James, are you coming up? Are you coming to your question? <laughs> I'll just introduce the next speakers. So we've got James Bannon, is District Crown Prosecutor at CPS Wessex and former hate crime coordinator. He was called to the bar in 1984 and has worked in prosecuting hate crimes since 2012. James has extensive experience in prosecuting hate crimes across Southern England. And Beth Sparks is Inclusion and Community Engagement Manager at CPS Wessex. Beth has worked extensively with communities across Wiltshire, Hampshire, Dorset and the Isle of Wight since taking the role three years ago and has over 20 years experience of working for large regional and national organisations in the public and private sectors. Thank you so much. I'll hand the floor over to you. Amazing. I wasn't going to use the microphone unless you need me to because I'm quite a loud human. So <laughs> if you pop it on the <laughs> in there. Oh gosh, I've messed it up now, Jane, haven't I? Sorry. <laughs> if you pop it in there, it's it will pick me up. On. Okay. And it, please put your hand up if you can't hear her, and then we'll force you to hold it. Yep, yeah, not a problem. problem. Not a problem. <laughs> I'm just a very hand, handy kind of person when I talk, which you'll get to see. Um, so firstly, thank you for inviting us along today, Jane, to speak. It's absolutely our pleasure to be here talking to you today on this very important subject. Um I have James here with me. In addition, Sophie, I hope you don't mind me referencing you. We also have Dr. Sophie Cook with us. She is our CPS Speak Out champion. And although she's not up here talking, she's a very, very valued colleague of ours. So if you have any questions later on, please do um, speak to Sophie. I know she's uh, happy to talk to you all. So 
Today, I'm going to talk to you a bit about, firstly, who the CPS are. So in my role, I do the outreach work with communities. I go and talk to them about who we are, where we sit within the criminal justice system, and, and more importantly, what we don't do. Because what I find is we're, we're not as visible as the police. We don't put uniforms on. We're not out walking the streets. And so people perhaps rely on what they see on television, in movies. Sometimes that leads to some fundamental misunderstandings as to what role we fulfill. So just a bit myth, myth busting there just to help you understand who we are and then um, a really important part is is what support can we offer to victims of hate crime and what are we doing to improve outcomes for victims of hate crime so I work really closely with the community I don't have the lived experience of being a trans person but I know that it's only through lived experience can we improve the service that we offer to the community to victims and witnesses to ensure that we're bringing perpetrators of this type of hate crime to justice because that is our own goal OK, so who are the CPS? We are the main prosecuting authority in England and Wales. So we only prosecute, we don't defend. OK, when we prosecute our cases, we're prosecuting them on behalf of the Crown. So the clue is in our title. So we are bringing justice on behalf of the Crown. Um, our kind of strap line, if we had one, would be we make sure that the right person is prosecuted for the right offence. And sometimes that means making the decision not to prosecute someone. That's an important part of our role, too. But no matter what we do, when we're delivering justice on behalf of the Crown, victims are absolutely at the heart of our work. A lot of my outreach work, I'll work with victims of hate crime, victims of domestic abuse, victims of rape and serious sexual offences, with the younger communities. And we know that there is intersectionality with crime, that you may have someone that is the victim of a rape, and the reason that they were targeted is because of their membership of one or more protected characteristics, which also makes it a hate crime. Through my outreach work, I know that when that incident takes place, it isn't over once the incident is over. That is the start of a victim's journey, and a victim never asks to be the victim of a crime. Particularly through our work with the trans community, I know that too many people accept things being shouted at them in the street, things being said to them, things being done to them is part of their daily life. We're here to say it isn't, it absolutely isn't. Hopefully by the end of today, you'll feel you know a bit more about us. And again, that builds that trust that you might have in us to report those incidents. So we work in really close partnership with Ricky. Dorset Police are a very valued partner of um, ours, but we're independent of the police. So another misconception is we are part of the police. Nope, we're independent, but we work in really close partnership. Our Director of Public Prosecutions is Max Hill KC, King's Council. Um, so Max is soon to be our outgoing uh, DPP. His job's on LinkedIn, if you fancy applying. Great role to have. Um, I was on a talk with uh, Max. We've recently launched our own social, uh, social mobility and diversity network. And one of his key goals for his people um, is that we are living in the community and representative of the community that we serve. We're bringing in people who have that lived experience because they are the people that know how these crimes impact on people. They are the people that are going to help us deliver the best quality of justice we can. So I will make no apologies for the fact I'm also going to try and encourage you all to come and work for us. <laughs> we want the community to be working for us because then we can be sure with that lived experience, we're delivering the best outcomes we can for victims. So nationally, we have 14 um, regions. We are CPS Wessex. So we cover Hampshire and the Isle of Wight, Wiltshire and Dorset. Um, there are 14 of me across the country, all working with our communities to improve our service to victims. We have about 5,000 members of staff. As we know, crime doesn't just happen between nine and five on a Monday to Friday. It happens 24 hours. And so it follows. We have an out of hours service that when someone's arrested, uh, the police 2 a.m. in the morning, they need an immediate charging decision. We are on the end of the phone for them. So we have an out of hours um, function called CPS Direct. One of the most common myths I deal with is that we um, are responsible for sentencing at court. No, we are not. That falls to the judges, to the magistrates, to the judiciary. And I say that because I see that a lot of time on social media. Oh, the CPS have got the sentence wrong in this in this case. Um, we can guide. Uh, our judiciary and they have to follow the sentencing guidelines so they themselves are bound by um, rules they have to follow but that's not our responsibility. 
hate crime is an absolute priority for the CPS. We're really proactive with the community, again, learning from them, helping them to understand who we are and how we can support victims of hate crime. Our conviction rate is strong. I don't want to um, overwhelm you with data today. I do have the data, so if you want to talk about that in your Q's and A's and what have you, please do. Um, but suffice to say, as a general rule of thumb, we get convictions in about 80% of our hate crime cases, and a lot of them are um, guilty pleas where the victim hasn't come to court to give their evidence. So, uh, you know, to be, be very explicit about that, about eight out of 10 cases we're seeing convictions which you know is strong but we recognize there is a gap in reporting transphobic hate crimes and it follows we are kind of what we get from the police is what we can then bring to court so if we're not getting those cases reported to the police then we're not getting the cases to make charging decisions on them to take perpetrators to court over them okay so again we know that there isn't the, the same levels of reporting for transphobic hate crime as there are for other protected characteristics. Disability hate crime for us is another outlier. We, we'd like to see more reporting and cases for, um, for that type of uh, hate crime. Um, we're bound by the victim codes of practice, which is widely available, and we have a victim right to review scheme. So if we make the decision to discontinue a case or to substantially alter the charges, victims have the right to challenge us on our decisions, and so they should. Um, again, that is a right that is very openly available and there's lots that you can read um, if you want to on the um, internet about that. We're proud to be one of the most diverse departments within the civil service. Um, as I've said, we recognise the importance of bringing in community members to advocate for their own community so that we can be sure our justice that we deliver is on point. Um, but that notwithstanding, we could always be more diverse. So again, a, a really shameless plug, please come and work for us. Please be a part of that change. So how do we make our decisions? We follow a two-stage test. Firstly, when we receive a file from the police, we'll look at the evidential stage. Is the evidence good enough? And we'll consider things like credibility, reliability of the evidence, admissibility. Once we can say, yes, we're satisfied the evidence has met our required standards, um, then we move on to consider the public interest test. Is it in the public interest to bring this charge? So the evidential stage that we work to for the first test isn't the same uh, sort of position the jury worked to beyond a reasonable doubt. It's a lower threshold. Is there a real, realistic prospect of conviction? I.e., is it likely we're going to get this case convicted? If we're happy the evidence is there and the public interest test is met, um, then we can make a decision whether or not we should prosecute. General is a rule of thumb. It's always in the public interest to prosecute hate crime, but there will be some outliers to that. Um, for example, if you've got a child that's, um, it's the first time they've committed that um, particular crime, they've said perhaps, you know, some uh, racist words in the street, and we actually think education would be the right outlet, then we would say, you know, the best thing is to educate this child, divert them away from the criminal justice system. We can only prosecute someone if both stages are met. So how do we support victims and witnesses at court? There are a number of measures that we can use that we call special measures. And these are conversations that really when police officers are coming to speak to victims of any types of crime, particularly around hate crime, where there might be barriers as to why victims feel they don't want to come and give evidence. Special measures are something we can help use to help take the stress out of giving evidence. We're never going to remove it completely. We know that going to court is stressful. I was a police officer for nearly 17 years myself. And even in a professional capacity, I got nervous going to court and I wasn't telling uh, the court about something really traumatic that had to me, uh, had happened to me. I wasn't reliving a trauma, being re-traumatised through giving evidence at court. So we know it's a big ask. Special measures are something to help remove some of that stress. So we'll have things like giving evidence remotely, so not coming into the courtroom, putting up screens around witnesses so that they don't see the defendant, um, things like intermediaries who can help us understand how that victim communicates, because some victims have different ways of communicating, giving a um, what we call evidence in chief, so a pre-recorded statement by video so that the a uh, victim or witness doesn't actually have to come into the court to give their evidence in chief, tell what has been, you know, tell the um, court what's happened. Instead, we just play a video. There are lots of different special measures we have um, that we can use, and we do that to encourage victims to make them feel supported through the court process. 
So prosecuting hate crime at court, one of the um, things that I wanted to just highlight on this slide is that contrary to the Equalities Act 2010, when we're looking at criminal laws and bringing about prosecutions for criminal laws, those are the five protected characteristics. I think the um, OWL uh, text there might be obscuring it, but they are sexual orientation, religion, disability, transgender identity and race. So there's much fewer protected characteristics than actually um, applies under the Equalities Act 2010. If someone is convicted of a hate crime at court, we use the victim personal statement to show the impact of that crime. And we absolutely should, as has been said before by speakers before, you know, Jack's talked about um, his own lived experience. Um, hate crime is the most despicable crime because it attacks the victims because of who they are. Something they are entitled to feel proud of. Is, a, is something they're attacked for. Um, we go into schools and we deliver hate crime uh, education workshops to children aged nine and 10 upwards. Um, and I deliver that with my colleague, Rachel, she's a young black woman, and she will talk to the children about how she felt at the age of six being racially abused and how that one snapshot, that short moment in time has lived with her throughout her life. Victim personal statements, bring the impact of that one snapshot moment, that one thing that is said, that transphobic moment in the street, a bit of banter muttered by the perpetrator. They walk away, the victim carries it because it's not the first time that word has been said to them, possibly even that day. Victim personal statements step outside of that one incident that's on trial, that one public order offence, and they build that bigger picture, that context the psychological impact that it's having on the victim, how their emotions are being impacted, how they go about their day-to-day -day activities, how they don't socialize in the same places, how they've lost relationships, how they've had to move, how they've lost jobs, how they're now on medication. That's a really important tool because it helps our judiciary, our bench, our magistrates who might not have that lived experience walk in the victim's shoes. And what those victim personal statements do is they then influence sentencing. Now, if someone is convicted of a hate crime, um, then the court can give the perpetrator an increased sentence. So, for example, if they're getting three months in prison for punching someone, the judiciary will announce that sentence and say, this is the basic offence I'm going to um, sentence I'm going to give you is three months. But because you have targeted that person because of their sexual orientation, because of the colour of their skin, because of their transgender identity, I'm increasing that sentence. So you are now getting an additional month. OK, now, not a lot of people know that that is in place, but it's another really important, clear demonstration that hate crime has no place in our society. That's called the sentence uplift scheme. So, as I've said before, and I know I'm probably not being as good with my time as Ricky was. Um, we work really closely with communities, as Ricky said, we know the value that lived experience brings to um, how we conduct our casework, how we prosecute perpetrators of hate crime, how we support and look after victims. Um, so as I said, we do hate crime awareness sessions. So beyond reflections, um, we've done hate crime awareness sessions with their support practitioners so that they can understand how they can better support the community that they're representing. We do listening events. So our chief crown prosecutor, which is like our the police chief constable, our most senior prosecutor in area, will go out and take feedback from communities. How do you feel about what we're doing? What could we do better? We want to learn from the victim experience and, and, and sort of take their feedback again to prove that we're doing. Um, we run mock trial events with um, students, with uh, school kids, again, to bring the law to life, but to help them appreciate an issue that perhaps isn't their world from a slightly different perspective. Um, you can see on that photo there, that's actually you, James. I've got you in that picture. <laughs> so this is our school education programme. You can see Rachel, our barrister in the middle. Not the um, same time. No, <laughs> not the same time. Um, and again, we have found, we've taken feedback from the community that education is key. So when we go into the school and we deliver these hate crime workshops, we'll talk to them about what hate crime is according to law, how we prosecute them. And again, it's about them being aware that you know, they're in years five and six, they're about to go to secondary school, they're going from being sort of top of the tree in terms of the playground, playground hierarchy to again, their bottom of the ladder when they go to secondary school, there's more peer pressure, there's less pastoral oversight from teachers, they might change their behaviour, they might start to um, express independence in different ways. 
kids know what being racist is, but do they always equate the fact that if you're racist, that also could be a crime, it could be a hate crime? No, they don't draw that comparison. So our education um, piece really serves to say, look, if you're using this language, if you're displaying, displaying this behaviour and you're 10 or over, you could also find yourself in court. It's a really powerful message, and I have to say it's probably the best thing that I do with communities because the kids want to learn. They want to do the right thing. They just need that educational sort of tool to help them. And then we have hate crime local scrutiny involvement panels, and that's when we invite the community in to come and look at our casework. We don't handpick five brilliant cases and say, aren't they great? Jane is on our panel. Um, Ricky is on our panel. We've also got a um, member of the trans community sits on our panel. We have representatives of the different protected characteristics. So they can look at, they can decide what cases they look at, and they can tell us what we did well so that we can replicate that for future victims, but actually what didn't go so well. And using their lived experience again, tell us how we could better serve their communities. So where can you find out more information? I'll leave that slide up there for you. We're gonna be available for Q's and A's. I know I've gone over time, so apologies. Um, I hope you found that of some use. Um, we, yeah, we're gonna be available for Q's and A's now. So hopefully um, any questions that people have, but I hope you found that useful. Jane Cordwell, who's an associate professor in sociology at Thorman. Jane has recently led on two funded projects working with LGBTQ plus communities in Dorset, Hampshire and the Isle of Wight. Today, she will be talking about her British Academy funded project on supporting swimming and wellbeing for transgender young people. Jane's teaching and research interests cross over sports, cultures, feminine theory, LGBT plus inclusion, underpinned by concern for social justice and equality issues. Thank you so much. I look forward to you. Um, Thank you. Uh, this is very last minute, I think. Um, and but I think it's a good project to bring to this group. Um, and Jay was involved as well, so Jay's happy to talk uh, about it from its inception. Really, it's now finished. Um, it occurred before COVID. COVID hit it hard because um, it was in a public swimming pool and everything got closed and what have you. Um, and since then, there's obviously been a shift as well. So. You know, I'm a sociologist of sport, and sport's been quite interesting in allowing trans rights and um, trans equality up to a recent point, which I think Jack's talked about, and then bang now, sports saying so you've got Lord Sebastian Coe, who's uh, the epitome of white colonial cis man, telling the rest of the world at World Athletics events that. Uh, trans women cannot take part in um, sport. So sport is one of those institutions where hate crime exists, but I'm not part of, you know, I don't know anything about the police, basically. I work with Jane, um, and I'm a sociologist of sport, physical activity. Um, and I guess that brings the body into play hugely. And so lots of people know from an early age that PE at school sort of favours some, empowers some, gives privilege, well, a, a minority, but they have a, a dominance. And then um, <clears throat> other people are kind of disregarded. So there's that classic film of Cares, I don't know if you remember, you know, and he's always the last kid waiting to be picked when they pick two, you know. So there's practices in sport which are horrifically marginalising and excluding. Um, and this was this project, so I wanted to look at... Um, sort of met Jay and, and met a group, a local trans group, who were going swimming um, as a kind of a social activity together at a local pool called Pelham's, which had what they call village changing rooms, so cubicles. So a lot of the stuff in sports sociology around um, transgender issues talks about the whole infrastructure of sport, so not just the ideologies, like whose body goes where, but how sports organised as well, and it's Huge binary, just change the Anyway, Pelham's had cubicles. Um, and then we've managed to get some funding and pay for more and more and more sessions. So they're privately run sessions. So th this idea of safety and, and unsafety spaces, so sports spaces can be hugely unsafe for, for transgender people, non-binary people, gender fluid people. And the surveillance is not only kind of structured by the governing bodies, but it's structured by other people within, within the sport as well. So um, it's a qualitative project. Um, we've got participants, we asked them if they'd like to draw after they've been swimming, 
Um, so the pictures around here are feelings of before and after. Um, some people wrote things uh, down about before and after. And then there's a company in London that does illustrations and um, so it's them and said, it's company come and, and illustrate this focus group, which we have in the triangle in the library there. And they said, oh, would you like a non-binary artist to come um, and, and do that for us? So during moments of this project, there were real kind of surprises of trans allies occurring. Um, even within the swimming pool, and I'm not saying everybody at the swimming pool, you know, there were some lifeguards that were, were anti-trans and there were some lifeguards that were very um, uh, positive around trans participation in swimming. But I guess some of the details of it, um, and it's sort of written in here, so I've kind of just picked this up last minute, but um, the way, and you can see this written on some of the stuff, the, the real difficulties some people have um, so here it's probably too small for you to see it. So in public, I'm dressed and I'm female presenting. The general public will look at me, look at my face, look down at my genitals, and then look back at my face. I don't, I don't get that from trans people. So it was, a, it was just a group for, for, for young trans people. And that talks about this violence, you know, this discrimination, these kind of small moments um, that you can't really sort of capture as a hate crime, if you like, but it's this kind of constant surveillance that goes on around, around the body. And there's a really good academic called Sarah, Sarah Ahmed, who talks about affinity of hammers, you know, the trans community just constantly getting these kind of, well, I guess we call them microaggressions now, wouldn't we, that um, being told you're in the wrong place. And swimming pools are one of those places where that happens. Um, if I'm in a public toilet, I just get that fear. If I'm on my own, I'm going to get picked on. I went to the toilet in Reverstoons. It wasn't too bad. I was walking out and there was an old man. Are you in the wrong house? I kind of laughed. You know, the kind of... And I think one of the clips um, from, uh, from the church group, looks like I feel like I'm constantly going to be tapped on the shoulder and told I'm here. Um, and the other clip was what uh, Jack talked about. The, you know, if you're in the changing room, the fear that, oh, will I turn the kids trans, you know, and, and we're in the factory group, people say, well, that's not a thing, you know. So this this kind of feeling that these young people had um, around fear of going to public stages, fortune phases, and especially swimming phases. And then the, the other pictures about afterwards, the kind of enjoyment and pleasure that they had as well, so the real combination of um, you know what we know structurally, what we know ideologically, what we know, and then these moments of um, kind of freedom, if you like. So it's you know I more about uh, feeling free. So as a researcher, how do you take that research to to make a difference? And before COVID, we were trying to work with the governing bodies of sport to try and keep pushing on their policy. And of course, what's happened now is there's been a, quite a big U-turn within sport. I don't know if people know, but they, a lot of the governing bodies have come out with new policies, which I think we definitely need to keep our eye on in terms of um, exclusion um, and regulation of bodies, um, especially trans bodies in sport. So I'll stop there because there's so much more. Um, and I know Jay might be speaking later today, so you might want to pick some of it up as well, or, or you can talk to yeah. Right, hello everyone, welcome back. Lovely to see you. So we've got two excellent presentations. The first is from Beyond Reflections, uh, which is a national charity that supports transgender, non-binary and questioning people their families and their friends in England and Wales. The charity's ambitions are to deliver world-class mental well-being support in a world where every gender diverse person can be their authentic selves. So I'll hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much. Um, there's fine, yeah, thank you. Right, hello everybody. Um, my name is Maximilian Mustafolt Sackville. Um, good to see lots of new faces. I always worry with these things that I'm going to mostly see faces that I already know, and it's good to see that there's a nice mix here today. Um, so, as the slide says, I'm going to be uh, having a bit of a chat with you today about offering support for people who have been victims of transphobic hate crime. So, um, 
as has already been said, we offer support to people uh, who are trans, non-binary, gender questioning. Um, that includes myself being hate crime lead. Um, so we support people with a variety of incidents that have happened to them. So the types of support that we offer, just to give you a brief overview before we jump into the meat of everything, um, we do telephone or video calls where we can have a bit of a chat with the person, work out what it is that they've been through, what they're needing support with, what kind of support they actually want going further on. We, talk, we offer regular check-ins once we've had that chat. You know, do you want to have another chat with me in a week or two? Do you want to have another chat with me in a month or so? Just to kind of check in where you're at, see if there's anything else you need. And we offer signposting and referrals as our main stuff that we do. Now, some of you will notice there's a big one missing from this. I will get to that in a moment. Um, but the signposting and referrals that we do tends to be things like victim care um, and other places where we can't support them with exactly what that other organisation would. So signing up for further support is another thing that we have a tendency to do here. If you come to us because you've been a victim and you potentially want some ongoing support, we might sign you up for our services. And our services include support groups, social spaces, uh, counselling, mentoring. There's a wide range of stuff that we do. And it's oh, obviously I'm not going to say it's not good, but it is. Um, so where does reporting come into this? Quite often when we have people come to us for support, they've either reported it themselves or they don't know whether or not they want to report it. Or they don't want to report it. What they want is some support with how they're feeling, with what's actually happened to them, with working through why it happened. A lot of people want to focus on the why. I can't give them that. But what I can do is I can support them to get the support they need to work out what they actually need. And that may or may not include a why at some point. But we find that the best way to up the amount of reporting we end up doing at the end of it is to not focus on it. Reporting is not what we offer first. It's not what we say this is the aim or the goal. It's what we get to at the end. So examples of support that we've given, a year of monthly check-ins. I had one person, literally an email every single month. And at the end of it, they reached a place where they said to me, okay, I've done these things for myself. And now I'm happy. So I had a couple of initial conversations. I think we had video calls um, where we talked over what had happened and what the options were. There were a couple of emails where they sent me, hey, I'm thinking of sending this to the organization within which this happened. Could you have a read over it before I send it? And then it was literally once a month I had it in my diary. I would send them an email and they would email back saying, yeah, don't need anything right now. And a year of us just checking in was enough for that person to do all the things that they needed to do to feel more empowered and feel back to themselves, which I personally think is a huge win because it's not much input and effort on my part at all, but it's had this outsized effect on the person of knowing, actually, we are here if there is something else you need. And had they turned around and said, actually, yeah, can I have a phone call? Or can we do a video call? Or can you proofread this letter for me? Or can you help me write a letter? I would have absolutely been there to do that. But having the knowledge that we were there was enough and quite often is. Single meeting with reporting and sign up. Now, this is quite a common one. We may or may not do reporting. We may or may not do sign up. But quite often, a lot of people, all they want is that one meeting. And I'll send them an email follow up. Hey, do you want to have a check in? Do you need anything else? And often I'll not even hear anything back. Sometimes I'll get a thanks, but it's all sorted. I'm feeling good about it. Sometimes that's all that's needed. It's one Let's have a talk and let's see what you need. Referring in by the police, we've had quite a few that have been referred in to us by the police after the crime's already been reported. So obviously we're not looking at reporting then. Yes, we're a third party reporting centre, but that's not the only thing that we do. And when the, the particular one that I'm going to talk about with this, when this person came in, they were feeling in an absolute shambles with things. They'd done everything that they could through the police route. The police had reached a point of, we can't do anything else because there's no more that we can do based on the evidence you have and what has happened. And what they needed was just that holding space, that space where they could come in, talk to us about, hey, this is what happened. This is the effect it had on me. This is how I'm feeling about it. And we wrote some things down together. And we literally, we sat on a video call, I typed up some notes, I shared the screen, I said, hey, this is what I've got, does that cover everything? Is there anything else that you feel that you want to be heard on? Do we feel like that is enough for you? And for this person, that's what they needed. 
So it doesn't always have to be, let's just have a chat about it. And it doesn't always have to be, right, we're going to go all the way to reporting. Sometimes these middle stages are the important part. And if there's one thing that you take away from my talk, I'm hoping that it's going to be that these middle parts are the important part. Because yes, the reporting can get stuff done. And yes, the fact that they can come in and actually say, hey, this thing has happened to me is super important. But a lot of the processing, a lot of the work is what's done in that middle bit. An interesting one that came up for me when I was looking at the support that we give to write this was the fact that we have LGBT liaison officers in the area that we predominantly work. Um, the amount of people who, when I said, hey, we can ask for a specific officer who is versed in this stuff to be involved, the amount of people who at that point turned around and said, actually, maybe I do want to report, or yes, I do want to report, was quite large. Because one of the biggest barriers that people are coming up against, when they're talking with me at least, is, well, if I take it to the police, I'm going to get misgendered by them, I'm going to have them not understand what's going on, I'm going to have all of this other stuff going on. So if we're looking at the reporting aspect of things and trying to increase that, having some form of understanding within the police force has shown to be something in my experience with the people that I work with that made things a lot easier for them. That said, I'm not a focus on reporting person. Yes, it's important that things go in the stats. Yes, it's important that people, if they want that support, get that. But my main aim is supporting the individual. And I've kind of covered this already. Not putting pressure on the end goals is the important bit. The end goals can change. They can be anything. They might be that the person wants to feel heard. It might be that the person wants to make a report. It might be that we feel that we want them to make a report or that we want them to do something. So rather than aiming at that, I always take the approach of, and we as a charity always take the approach of, people come to us, their goals might change. We don't need to have an agenda beyond supporting them with what they're working on. And if you can work within that space and not put any pressure on, or at least not put much pressure on any kind of aim goals, you might need for whatever business you're working in, whatever charity you're working for, um, to, to have that end goal of, well, we've got to reach this but if you can aim in the interim at least to not have that end goal you are far more likely to reach a space where people feel comfortable enough to share things further and potentially report if that's what we're aiming for and they're also more likely to come in for further support now when we get to the point where the further support sorry i'm going to start that again when we reach a point of talking about what they need after they've done the stuff that they need to do with us around hate crime, that's when we're looking at, well, what does it look like next? Maybe there's some support that needs to happen. Maybe there's not. But actually, the people that we put less pressure on seem to be more likely to come back and actually have some further support, which, as I'm sure some of you will be aware, can be a factor in them being a little bit more confident and a little bit more um more relaxed in themselves and potentially not getting into these pickles in the first place if it's something that is to do with confidence and that let's not go down the whole victim blame route but we know that that can be a factor in some cases so i'm going to finish up and i've just had a five minute warning which is very helpful because my last slide will be uh, just under five minutes there we go. um <laughs> i've got some numbers for you in terms of what we have done in beyond reflection so i've, I've pulled the numbers from 2022 um five in eight of people coming to us did report to the police. However, only one in eight of them needed our support to report. So the, the others, it would have been either, um, either they've already reported and they've come to us afterwards, or because they are then choosing to make a report, having had some conversations with us and working out what that might look like. Half of them we signposted for victim support in some form or another, on some form or another, apologies. Um, so that's about looking at what's available in their area in terms of the victim support side of things. Um, those people are not necessarily the same people who wanted to report anything. 
Um, so sometimes we have people who come to us who just want support and they might want that wider support still as well uh, without reporting to the, the police and working through it that way. One in four of the people that we supported only wanted to talk when they came to us. So their stated goal was, I want someone that I can talk to. I don't need it to go any further. I just want to feel heard. And then what we've offered to people outside of that, um, or rather what we've offered to people after that, when they've come in, they've had that talk, we've offered that extra check-in or three or five or however many they need. Um, they've often then gone on to have that other support and to make those reports in a number of cases. So thank you all for listening. Thank you. So we're happy, I would speak as next. And then we'll do Q&A afterwards. So do you want to come up? You ready? Just, just, yeah. <laughs> So we have Beth Brewster and Charity Gardner, I hope I pronounced those correctly, join us from Space Youth Project in Dorset. Charity is a youth worker and Beth is a youth support worker. Space Youth Project is an organisation that is designed to support young people who, who are or may be LGBT plus and to empower them to have positive self-esteem, know they are supported, have a sense of community and to help overcome issues caused or intensified by prejudice. You do not need to say the trans definition, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Space you use the, oh, there we go. That's yeah, the right. I, I feel like everyone yeah, 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 gets it. Yeah. So I'll give the floor to you. Really looking forward to it. Yeah. Right, I'm just going to There we go. <laughs> now my big head's not in the way. So, right. so as always, like everyone else, we've got stats. Um, so 85% of LGBT uh, students experience homophobic and transphobic violence in schools, as your name is Ashton. Ashton. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> as this person said, um, we do work with young people. So all our stats are about LGBT young people, about trans young people. 45% um, of trans students drop out of school um, and homophobic violence also targets 32% of students who are wrongly perceived to be LGBT because they do not appear to contact a lot. Those are me again. Okay, there's been found a high correlation between victimization and lack of, lack of concentration in class, lower marks and attendance for trans youth. And homophobic and transphobic violence is also associated with poorer than average physical, mental health, including increased risk of anxiety, fear, depression, self-harm, and suicide. So, hey, young LGBT people are three times more likely to self-harm, twice as likely to contemplate suicide as their non-LGBTQ peers, according to a survey, which was just like us 2021. More than a third of trans people, 36%, one in eight, LGBT disabled people whose activities are limited a lot, and one in five LGBTQ people of non-Christian faith say they've experienced discrimination from within the community because of different parts of their identities. Another study that was LGBT in Britain, that was 2017. Those figures haven't got better, they've got worse. So these, these are some statements from our young people. Um, our young people that produced this sample were um, 12 to 17. So, do you I'm want to do it? Show my young person voice. So, I hear the latest news either here or in America with people being homophobic. I don't have many safe spaces or safe things. I feel quite scared at times. I know at any point in my life can be stripped, at any point my life can be stripped away from me and I'd have to hide away who I really am from everyone. It makes me angry and sad. I know there are people more vulnerable than I am. I'm completely out as trans and my family accepts this, but I know people who can't come out as they would not be accepted. It's all very scary. I must point out that these are ver verbatim. So yes, there's gonna be some strange words in there. So it's hard walking into school and then realizing, okay, I've got another day. Something's gonna happen. It's not something might happen, it's something is going to happen. That's how much homophobic content is out there. Four out of five, four days a week, I will get a comment on my sexuality. 
people are just terrified. And a lot of the time, LGBT kids, kids end up taking their own lives at a very young age because of their lack of acceptance and thinking they will never be normal. There's still stuff like going on, like people misgendering, being transphobic. Like a few months ago, me and my friends, we both got like food thrown at us and water and stuff and being called Chinese and things like that, which wasn't nice. But, you know, I can't really change it because it happened. I'm just kind of stuck with it. Adults are not really very good listeners when we try to explain how we go. It's not all bad. It's not all bad. That's space. What we like to do is give our young people the chance to be themselves. And these are statements that they make about us. Every time I go to space, I always sense the air of belonging, which is a good thing. It makes me feel like I really belong. It's like you fit in somewhere and just so long a feeling you don't and can relate to other people's experiences. I like space because I'm stealth everywhere. Does everyone know what stealth means? No. Okay, so stealth is when um, a trans person will not disclose their trans identity. So they'll be um, outwardly presenting and identifying as their gender, um, but will not tell anyone that that is not what they were assigned above. I like space because I'm stealth everywhere apart from at home. And it's nice to have a place that I can talk about things without having to think about people not being aware or knowing. And you'll always get a positive response. It's my only way of freedom away from all the transphobic people I meet at school. Because there are a lot of LGBT youth workers and you get to see them and they are happy and living a life and you can see that you can do that. When I first came, I was having a rough time and I've consistently come to group and I've become a lot more confident and happy in myself. The only place in my social life where acceptance is guaranteed. So, what can you do? Well, please educate yourself. Um, and that goes for all services, not just the individual sat in here. Do your research and get professional training. Use your pronouns. When you meet a new young person, ask them their name and pronoun. This indicates that you have an understanding of the LGBT plus community and you are supportive. Consider having LGBT talks with your groups, bringing awareness to your young people or your service users or the people working with you. And promote understanding and inclusion within your groups. Call out any homophobic or transphobic language that you hear. Explain why this is unacceptable. And I think this is the most important one that everyone forgets. We will get caught up in our policies, in our procedures, um, in the guidance, in the advice. Ask LGBT people what they need. If they tell you something that they need, whether that is extra training or anything like that, do that. Um, and can I just also say that if you're getting professional training, making it voluntary for your entire staff, that's not, it, it's not training if it's voluntary. If it's, the only, <laughs> if the only people who are going to show up are the people who want to, and they're not the people we need to affect for the training. Um, so only training that counts as mandatory. So here's a few organisations that can help. Um, we've just pulled together just a few of them. There are lots of them, like Beyond Reflections. Yeah, so. Mermaids. We have no mermaids, hopefully. Uh, supports trans, non-binary and gender diverse children and young people, as well as their families and professionals involved in their care. Gyres. Now, I don't know whether you know about Gyres. You should do because it's a UK-wide organisation whose purpose is to improve the lives of trans and gender diverse people of all ages. Really, 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 I uh, insist that you should go and look at their website. It is full of information, not misinformation, actually good information. Mildline Trans Plus is an emotional and mental health support helpline for anyone identifying as trans, non-binary, gender fluid and questioning. They also support family members, friends, colleagues and carers. And of course, Stonewall. We all know Stonewall is an LGBT uh, rights charity in the United Kingdom. Absolutely. So, resources and tools. This one is one that most people I talk to have never heard of. And when I, earlier when we said about uh, making sure you do your own research, 
this comes in handy when you do that. This is an add-on to your browser. Um, I use Chrome, it's very easy to install on Chrome. Um, and what it does is it highlights any, any links, um, depending on whether they're transphobic um, or trans friendly. So the green is trans friendly and the red is transphobic. I have it installed on my work computer um, so that if I'm doing any research at all, I know it's coming from a source that is not biased and not focused on trans hate. Um, so do, do, do get that. And especially if you're, you've got young people or trans anyone um, under your service who is looking up things, looking for answers to their questions, make sure they've got this because there's nothing worse than having vulnerable people looking up things that will help them and only finding it. Okay, the gender kit uh, is the gender construction kit is an open resource project run by volunteers and is a guide to changing all things linked to gender. To gender. I.e. names and gender recognition. Yeah. Um, YouTube.com slash Pop and Ollie um, are amazing resources using thousands of schools throughout the UK. If you saw our stand in the other room, there are um, a little pile of books which have lots of good resources for um, supporting young people, primary age roughly, um, on all things diversity. Pop and Ollie make those books. Um, and on Pop and Ollie on their YouTube, you can find videos that go with every single book. You can find videos aimed at primary school age children who will definitely come in handy with some of the adults we know, um, basically giving them the knowledge and how to explain um, things in really simple terms, especially when it comes to gender identity and diversity. This one, I don't know anything about you, but I talk about that. Um, it's basically just because um, I'm aware we're at currently in the university building. Um, so this is a website, basically a website page saying, this is what you need to know if you're an LGBT student in the UK. Um, yeah, there we go. And finally, the reason we're here. Um, so this is our organization. This is what who we work for. This is why we're here. Um, as Ash, well done, oh, hey. um, <laughs> said in our bio, we aim to support young people who are or may be LGBT plus under the age of 25 um, and empower them to have positive self-esteem, to know they are supported, to have a sense of community and to overcome issues caused or intensified by prejudice in order to facilitate freedom of expression. We run youth groups across Dorset. And when I say across Dorset, I mean across Dorset. We're <laughs> Bournemouth, Poole, Christchurch, Weymouth, Dorchester, Bridport. We've also got a group uh, just around the corner in Boscombe, which is for trans young people, although most of our young people across the entirety of our youth groups are trans. Um, we also run, and this, this, this is pivotal, this is juicy information for you guys, we run <laughs> Space Family Days. Now what Space Family Days are, they're events, day-long events for um, trans, non-binary, gender questioning young people to come with their entire family. Um, and that can be parents, carers, grandparents, aunts, uncles, all the siblings. And it's a space where not only can the young people get support, but the entire family can. And I don't know how many times we've got parents being like, what do I do? Um, send them to us. It's an amazing resource. They build a massive net network. Jay, isn't it sick? Yeah, is it sick? <laughs> it's, it's a pretty good resource, isn't it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. All, it, all the parents there build a massive network where they support each other. Um, and yeah, it's a really good resource. Um, so thank you. These are our apps. Quick. Word of explanation, you may have noticed that I was a little bit uptight with Mr. Banda and his organisation. Um, yeah, we were both at an event last August where we were assaulted. The police took five months to take statements. Now you know where the anger comes from. Yeah, um, and it's we are obviously we try our hardest to promote reporting um, and to make sure our young people know what to do if they're ever in that situation. I think there's a panel thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so it is quite hard, which is why whenever we're around the police, we need to, we have to say something, ask questions and stuff. But also I just remember the person in here who asked me to say it isn't here. Um, we do get funding from Born Free Community Fund. It's not, a well, no no amount of funding is ever enough. Uh, we've recently lost our children in need funding, uh, which pay, literally pays our wages. 
Um, so if any of you know of any funding opportunities or work for a big, not to say that word, a big company um, with lots of money to give out, <laughs> get in contact with us, please. I'll, uh, I need more wages. <laughs> Thank so take a picture of the center go on hello everyone <laughs> This mask that I wrote down. Another Tina Turner number, can we? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I must feel like a bit like Madonna. <laughs> I feel like karaoke is my message to any conference. I always manage to miss it. I don't miss my colleagues doing karaoke on so many occasions. I feel like they're deliberately. I've never done it. I always feel as if somebody's going to ask me to step into the garden walls. Oh, it's excruciating. Nobody really enjoys it. No, I, don't. Yeah, I think you'd have to be quite drunk. Oh, no, it's doing us. It's type, typing out us chatting about karaoke. This is going to be edited later. Maybe. Unless they can spell karaoke. Yeah. So I Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're just about to start the uh, final panel of the day. I thought it was going to be a bingo call at the end. Uh, for those who've joined us since lunch, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my name is David Wilkin. I specialise in disability hate crime, but I, I'm not the most important pe person here. It's been a fascinating day, you know, and thank you for everybody and your contributions. We've had such a mixture from academics, from practitioners, from people who've experienced hate and hostility, and it's been quite eye-opening uh, and at times quite passionate. Um, so thank you very much, everybody. We've got uh, this panel now consists of a very interesting mixture of uh, academic work and experience. Uh, Katie McBride is joining us from the University of Plymouth. Uh, Katie is a practitioner in um, uh, rights and is a, a researcher in trans people's uh, hate crime. Uh, we then have uh, Gina Grenfell, who is joining us from Edinburgh online. Uh, Gina used to teach uh, people who spoke other languages, teaching English to people at TESOL. Uh, speak, uh, teaching English to speakers of other languages. I'll get it right eventually before we all break up. Um, and now researches uh, hate crime with transgender females um, and the effect on health. Uh, and is involved in uh, university summer schools in Scotland, which sounds like a very interesting project. I wonder if there's any vacancies. Uh, and following that, we'll have uh, Orlando Harvey, who's on the staff here, interviewing uh, Jay Murray about experiences. They've recently written a chapter together, and perhaps some of that chapter will be revealed in the later discussion. But first of all, it's Katie. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Very, very kind, thank you. Um, so I am currently 
my role at the moment is at the University of Plymouth. I'm a criminologist um, and my work revolves around the experiences of trans people um, in the widest remit of hate. And I always feel like a bit of a fraud when I come to, to events and speak um, alongside my colleagues who work within hate crime because I am interested in hate crime, but I swiftly move on from hate crime because my work very much revolves around the broader endemic issue of the harms of hate that exist um, in wider society and the, the kind of wider context that facilitates and generates hate and the harms that come from that in society. So prior to um, entering back into academia and getting my, my title as doctor, I was in the, I was kind of like, what's it called? Poacher turned game. Like Jack, Jack was saying earlier, I've gone over to the dark side. So prior to joining academia, I was a policy officer working in local government. So back in the day when hate crime was a very kind of new concept, I was responsible for setting up hate crime systems within local governments and was very much part of the machinery of kind of regulation and, and legislation. I then went to work in the third sector and ended up as chief exec of the Equality and Human Rights Body, Equality Southwest, which some of you who've been around for a while might be familiar with and that was a, an organization that worked with networks of people activists organizations who were working around each of the protected characteristics that were covered by the equality act um, in the with the aim of sharing good practice uniting voices becoming stronger together across a regional perspective um, and I was then the, the, the network lead for the trans network that was established. And again, it was kind of early days and there were not many organisations at the time set up specifically to support trans individuals. So it was very much a group of, of people with lived experience who were trans activists themselves trying to mount some change and resistance to the, the transphobic um, environment that was that was that the was of the day um, that subsequently worsened. And I'm now, as I say, a criminologist and a lecturer working around systemic violence, marginalization, and social justice. I'm not gonna declare the, the, the stats, um, but I think I want to underscore potentially, I'm really sorry I missed Jack's um, talk this morning. I was sat on a train between Basic <laughs> Stoke and Bournemouth, having the time of my life. Um, <laughs> but I, I think I'll probably underscore some of the wider points that have been made today around the stats. So we kind of, we were probably familiar in the room with the horrendous upsurge in um, hate crime against trans people that's been recorded. Um, you know, this year alone, the 2021 figures represent a 56% increase in hate crimes recorded against trans people, the biggest uptick in the history of reporting. Trans people's experiences of justice, um, researched by my, my colleague and friend Mark Walters, and I'll refer to his work um, throughout, shows that trans people's experiences of hate crime um, impacts upon the ways in which they come into contact and are viewed by um, members of the criminal justice system, in particular the police. More trans people contacted the police regarding a hate crime than non-trans people in Mark's research back in 2020, and they're more likely to believe that the police are less effective at dealing with anti-LGBT hate crime. Violent incidents were not always taken seriously, and indeed in this research, police were implicitly or explicitly asserting that the victim was the cause of the incident. I wanted to, I'm glad that I included this slide after the conversation with the CPS this morning. So this is, it's, it's, it's age data now, and it's from, again, Mark's work back in 2018. But they um, did a piece of research that looked at kind of the life cycle of hate crimes from different um, protected characteristics. And it is more challenging for trans hate crime because they said kind of the numbers are smaller and it's a relatively recent phenomenon to be recording. Um, instance against trans people but from the data that was available in 2015-16 you can see that there's this attrition rate in terms of incidents get reported into the system but those that end up actually being prosecuted and receiving the sentence uplift that's available through our legislation very much smaller than those that enter the system so there is there is that that problem and exists as, as positive as we might feel about how it's kind of gone in the right direction and there are more prosecutions um, it is problematic in terms of how cases fall away from the system and there are multiple reasons that Mark um, and his colleagues explore within that piece of research. So we know that official reporting systems 
are ineffective, they're inefficient, they don't tell the whole story. Um, so trans people we know are some of the least likely to report incidents into the criminal justice system. They're more likely to be targeted by hate crimes that involve physical violence and assault, most likely to have experienced indirect victimization as a result of incidents that have direct, directly impacted other trans people. So that's kind of the official kind of picture and it's, it's grim. My work, as I say, is more interested in the wider system and the experiences that people have outside of the criminal justice system. Um, and just some of those include the misrepresentations of trans identities within the media, the barriers people access to participation within leisure, we've heard about earlier around swimming as one of those examples of barriers in sports, the challenging family environments and other later significant relationships that also manifest forms of hate and harm in people's lives, and the structural failures that support trans individuals to successfully flourish in an active pursuit of citizenship within their civil lives. All of this takes place within and is heightened and heated by the most recent kind of example of trans politics being pushed to the forefront of what's called the culture wars. And that in itself is a kind of a new gear in terms of how that transmission of hate and harm is um, promulgated through our society. So we all know about the kind of the, the backlash around the, the even mere mention of legal reforms and the gender recognition consultation that was then binned, the response to kind of Scottish self-declaration and the UK I suppose a conversion therapy ban that excluded trans people, the media um, response is heightening, the Daily Mail, social media is recognised as a transmitter of a message crime that is a form of secondary victimisation that impacts upon trans people. Um, and research by McLean and Ellis shows that there's a, there's a silent radicalisation occurring through social media and other forms of media, um, and that produces a hate feedback loop that we are all within knowingly or those that aren't interested in knowing what kind of feedback loop they're in are absorbing. Um, as, as a result of kind of how the rhetoric and the narrative plays out around trans identities at the moment. And my particular interest is in, is in drawing out the wider context and the role that that plays in generating and manifesting these forms of hate. And the particular point about our wider society that myself and my colleague that I'll refer to in a moment in our work is around the fact that we exist within a neoliberal landscape. That's characterized by, for example, austerity, the underfunding of services that are well needed, the cost of living crisis, an anti-regulation agenda that gives people limited access to be able to challenge where um, they're even kind of happy to and have the strength to challenge. Um, the profit-driven narrative and priorities of our, our public system, let alone our private system, um, the competition and um, focus on consumerism as the kind of the, the whole point of our lives, our existence as human beings, and individualism and the responsabilization of us as individuals. It's our problem to get ourselves out of the, the mire that is characteristic of our society now. There's, a, there's an unwritten kind of narrative that suggests that life's tough, people. It's our job as individuals to get ourselves out of it. It's not about the system, the system's hard, we're all part of it, we're all equally part of that, but individuals are responsible for digging themselves out of the quagmire and, and, and solving their own problems ultimately. Just gonna mess up my own system. So just a, 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 an example, one example, before I move on to talk about kind of our research and, and where we're taking this discussion. It's one key example of the harms of hate that we're trying to bring a broader and more specific attention to. Um, is, for example, shown through the disproportionately long waiting times for first appointments at UK gender identity clinics. So these are figures from 2022 from NHS England. The number of children, for example, waiting um, on the list for first appointment with a gender identity clinic appointment is approximately 7,600, of whom about 6,000 6, have been waiting for more than 18 weeks. And the figures, you know, we, we know it, and I, I feel like I'm... You know, I'm in that room where I'm speaking to people who know it and, and I appreciate I'm not challenging anybody's fundamental core beliefs in this room, but the, it's, it's, it's worth stating and con con 
to con continue to state and reassert um, that the harms of hate are real and they have real impacts on how services are underfunded, how they're reluctant to deliver the support that they're there to do, and it has real impacts on further people's lives. So this is really about underpinning of where I started. Hate crime legislation and the legislative environment, the criminal justice system serves a purpose. It's a very important part of this jigsaw, but a sole focus on the criminal justice system and legislation and the prosecution of individuals who have been found guilty of perpetuating hate is only a small part of the puzzle that we need to address as a society. I was in Ireland last week. Ireland have no legislation that recognises that hate crime exists, so I understand the importance of having established you know, groundwork that builds from legislation. However, a criminal justice and policing focus takes a, 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 a too much focus on a perpetrator perspective. So it, it, it serves the purpose of it reduces our conceptualization of, what, conceptualization of what hate is in terms of a perpetrator and a victim. It's about individuals and how the interplay between individuals plays out. Whereas we know that there are structural narrative discourse, social media um, institutions that play a role as well. It pathologizes hate or conceives of those who perpetuate hate as irrational individuals. It's about, it's the bad egg, the bad apple analogy that makes, again, joking. <laughs> I'll do my best, but maybe 10. Um, okay, so the pathologization, it, it reduces it down again. It allows, it, it un unwittingly allows us to go, okay, if we just focus on getting the baddies, then we'll ad address the problem. But in actual fact, we don't. It deflects through this individualization approach from the structural and systemic causes and makes them invisible. It normalizes hate in terms of, as I was saying earlier, we have to just accept that it's a part of everyday life, people. Just, just get on with it. Um, and austerity, um, it, 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 it veils over the inequalities that, that are, are significant and embedded within an austerity driven agenda. So our work um, looks at things slightly differently. So critical hate studies developed by my colleague and myself, Dr. Zoe James, who works with gypsies and Roma and travelers and their experiences of hate and harm in society. And what our work, um, lots of theoretical stuff that you can go and read about it, but basically what it's asking us to do is to think about, thinking about that thing about not just focusing on the baddies of individuals who perpetuate hate, thinking about if we could rewrite you know, our lives and think about human existence and what do we want from life. We don't just want to put in legislation that protects people from the baddies that we're going to just accept exist and that hate's part of it. What can we do as a society to re-establish um, what the core principles of, of flourishing human people, what do we need as flourishing individuals? Um, and that perspective allows us to kind of draw the camera out away from those individual interactions, look at the wider things that are at play that facilitate and generate hate and harm in our society. And through our um, theorizing, you can look at both the victims' experiences, but also how offenders end up offending. Because what the research shows us is that the everyday nature of hate victimization and also the banality of some offenders' um, motivation for getting into those, those um, hate um, incidents and crimes, it's not necessarily they're based on some sort of really core inbuilt de de deep um, hate for individual groups and they kind of have ended up in that situation, they can't necessarily explain it themselves but we can through a scrutiny of the structural systems and the discourse that's allowing and perpetuating ideas that that stuff is okay in society. So what we use in our research is Majid Yar's work around understanding how, how do you see social harm? So if we're interested in wider harms that aren't just about those interactions between two individuals or a few individuals against another individual, what do we, um, how can we conceptualize what the harm is? And Majid Yar says that every individual person, human needs love, we need solidarity and we need respect. And at any point in our lives, if we look at where those things have been denied, any individual has had love, solidarity or respect denied to them. You can conceptualize those and pinpoint it as a harm has taken place against those individuals or indeed groups. Um, here's just some of my data from the work that I've done with older trans people. So this work was undertaken in 2016. 
with people who were 40 was the youngest, that's not old, um, 40 was my youngest <laughs> participant, right through to um, 80 plus. So these were people reflecting upon the roles of their, their younger years, their loving environments and the, the, the impact that had on their their lives and it weren't they were none of this is defined as a hate crime kind of that's the point is these were harms nonetheless but none of them are defined within the hate crime um, legislation or that kind of picture so Katie talks about the thing which people certainly haven't got a clue about now is the conditioning that you had you had to have a job for life you had to marry you had to have 2.45 children your wife had to stay at home and look after your kids but of course that changed in the 60s it improved a bit so I just knuckled down and a lot of my research also identified how that wider context was absorbed by trans individuals themselves and led them to perpetuate harms against themselves harms against other trans people within wider trans communities how those those kind of the rhetoric the belief that there are certain people who are better than others and there's a certain way of being trans led them to perpetuate harms against each other as well Jenny Ann talked about how my parents were very cross about me being trans and called it wicked behaviour, which meant I hid it as a child and then even as an adult when I had some difficulties in my marriage because of my gender variance, my dad said, I don't want to talk to you, you need to sort it out medically and what they were referring to was um, treatment by the medical system in the form of, um, I can't say the word, what did I just call it? Conversion. Yes, conversion therapy. Then, Thinking about solidarity, those who've had a lack of love in their younger years um, leads pushes them into the arms of, of trans communities and others to seek to seek solidarity and to, to find esteem with others and leaves them vulnerable to the certain kind of discourses that occur then. And I recognize that in, in some of what's been said today, the, the labor, the, the invisible labor that goes on, trans people themselves feeling they have to step in, they're the only way that change can happen is I have to do it myself, I have to step into those roles and I have to be the change that you all need to be making but I'm doing it. So lots of examples of how that played out with um, the trans people that I was speaking with as well. Earning respect. So we talked a lot about how when people were seeking respect through the, the, the available legal systems, so we talked about gender recognition certificates and how very few of them had the capacity to engage with that system. Some didn't have the funds, some were dyslexic and couldn't engage with those systems, and others just recognised that system as harmful in and of itself and not what they needed and what they, the kind of the way that they wanted to, to be their trans identity and themselves. Um, so lots of people recognizing how the systems that they were pushed into that were sold to them as systems of support, systems of um, kind of a savior, this is how you're going to embody and be your true self that you always wanted to be, actually ended up being sites of harm themselves. So in seeking respect, they were pushed into further systems of regulation and um, harm. So, sorry. Um, the conclusion kind of thoughts, there are there are several and there are many beyond this um, in terms of implications for policy. So critical hate studies, as I've said, calls for a broader appreciation of the harms that trans and indeed other people who are marginalised in society experience in the pursuit of a livable, a viable existence, taking account of the nature of the development of self that we can go into it later if you want to talk about it. Um, and it necessitates this shift away from the focus on the, 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 the hate crime um, agenda as one that's focused and embedded within a criminal justice system. Actually, we need to move beyond, yes, it's a piece of the puzzle, but let's not get fully distracted by fixing a system that has lots of integral kind of injustices built within it. Let's think wider, broader as a society, about how, what else we can do to help people to flourish um, and to, to eradicate some of those harms that exist within places of security and safety supposedly such as the family um, so bottom up um, social mobilization is one of those ways that we can do it and again it's difficult within the current environment where austerity is such an integral part of, of that system but what I believe is the true way forward is to go back and re-support embed um, and um, facilitate with funding um, and real true kind of belief that people need to be supported to, to mobilize as communities as well so I'm sorry for going over and I probably rammed a bit at the end but that's that's the general gist of what our research does. Uh, thank you, Katie. Uh, 
Interesting, yeah. Interestingly, there are more links there to the wider social problems of the economy and to how the, the country is being governed um, and to how excuses are made in, in socio politics in order to make uh, back to good old moral panics again and, and uh, social, social uh, outcasts as we all have been made from time to time. Um, not popping up there it is okay we're just there it is. we're just getting you online gina thank you for joining us uh we operate quite a tight uh, time regime here i'm sorry about that we've got the we've got the, we've got the conference director on one side and we've got a 21st century surveillance device called the owl on the other side and it's, it's making me quite paranoid actually but um we're almost ready to join you just uh, gina can you hear us and see us yeah, can you see me? Yes, we can. Okay. Nice and loud. Is everybody happy with that volume? Yeah, mm -hmm. great. Fantastic. You're coming through loud and clear. Gina, the floor is yours, and I'll let you know verbally when we're down to five minutes to go. Thank you. Sorry, just trying to... Okay. Um, yeah, welcome, and thanks also to Katie for that great talk. A lot of things were jumping out um, from the talk about the transmitter of... Meth of message crime, silent radicalization, hate feedback loop. I think my talk today is gonna to touch a little bit on that. So um, so yeah, thanks Katie for that. So um, my name's Gina, Gina Gwenfewi. It's a Welsh surname, so don't worry if it's difficult to pronounce. Um, pronouns she, her, and I'm at Edinburgh University. And Edinburgh University has become a kind of crucible for a lot of tensions between uh, trans rights, trans activism, dignity of trans people and the gender critical movements. Of course, it's the city of JK Rowling as well. Um, so it's a city where a lot of stuff has happened a lot at the university as well. And I'm gonna talk about some of the tensions today that have been happening there. And my talk is really focused more on universities and campuses more than anything else to do in relation to hate. Okay, um, I do have some main points that I want to kind of address right at the outset so that you know where I'm going with this talk. If I can... Sorry, let me try and it's a bit frozen. It's not moved. Try again. Yeah. One moment, I'll stop and I'll start again. Let's try again. We did a year and a half of teaching like this. I know. <laughs> Okay, let's try again. Okay, so my main points are the most impactful ca campaigns of hate and delegitimization against trans the trans community begin with the manipulation of language um, in terms of the use of progressive language such as free speech, academic speech, academic freedom, protect women and children, um, these defensive uh, forms of protecting rather than saying, let's take away trans people's rights. Um, Anti-trans hate campaigns, either in policy making or at universities, rarely reference trans people and their rights. Um, that would be too illiberal sounding. Um, instead, they reference, uh, well, they use empty signifiers like challenging gender ideology, gender identity theory, transgenderism, or the trans lobby. That way you're moving trans people and their rights out of the conversation and the illiberal campaigning uh, looks a lot less illiberal. And finally, this is very direct to Edinburgh University, but I'm sure most universities have a dignity and respect policy. There can be no dignity and respect or anti-discrimination policies to protect vulnerable minorities from hate and harassment when an institution embraces free speech absolutism these things are incompatible. And I'll talk about what free speech absolutism is. Um, okay, so first of all then, as well, having gone over my points, I don't want to talk about how scary it is to be trans at the moment in Britain. Like we can see what's happening in the United States. We see the headlines. We see the intensification of this hate language. It's gone from just having concerns uh, to basically now language like the, the eradication of transgenderism by the political commentator Michael Knowles and politicians such as Donald Trump saying basically they will you know eliminate 
um, social and well the means to social and medical transitioning for trans people if they get into power and in fact in about half of US states now there are hundreds of legislations to outlaw either for trans youth or for all trans people social and medical transitioning um, and meanwhile to, to, to see the connections here with Britain I mean there's been a moral panic now for approximately five or six years since about 2017 when the GRA reforms that had been covered by a media that was ill-equipped to talk about the minutia of trans policy making because the, the media in Britain is elitist, doesn't know about these things, and um, it fell back to the default setting, which is fear. And so we see articles like Janice Turner's children sacrifice to appease trans lobby. Again, this term trans lobby, we're not talking about trans people, that would be too humanizing. So it's it's treating trans people as, as a thing, as a concept to be challenged, to be eliminated. Similarly, uh, the headline with Selena Todd about freedom of speech, about academic being silenced by the trans lobby. And you'll also see these images like uh, with Julie Bindle and with Kathleen Stock, uh, real media players, people, anti-trans campaigners who are in the media all the time claiming to be silenced by trans people. Um, this, this real paradox of what's going on. Um, and what's the result in Britain? Well, we've already had people talk about this. It's, it's this increase in anti-trans hate crime um, correlating with the media attention, the, the media moral panic. Um, there's been a lot said about this, this media moral panic, Council of Europe, ILGA Europe, Amnesty International, lots of international organizations condemning the British media for, for a really clearly manufactured attack on trans people, a demonization, a stigmatization of trans people. And unfortunately that has led also to shifting attitudes in the public against trans people and really a replication of what happened in the 1980s where you saw an in intensified kind of contagion and groomer and predator narrative against the gay community um, from around 1983 to 1987 um, public attitudes really shifted in very hostile ways against the gay community leading to section 28 and you, you can see a similar kind of pressure now with conservative governments once again um, trying to exploit this, this um, shift in, in attitudes, this hostility. The trans people are kind of scared right now in Britain. They, they, there's this feeling of disempowerment. What can you do against such powerful institutions? Um, this kind of connects to me with some of my research as, um, as a researcher in, in uh, literature and film, in fact. So I do, I do want to briefly touch upon the kind of historical context of this this campaigning of stigmatization against trans people. So a film that I've looked at recently is uh, Birth of a Nation from the beginning of the 20th century, this race baiting film that really worked as a, as a means, as a tool by the Ku Klux Klan as a recruiting tool. And the African-American um, community at the time, they were very aware of what this film could do in terms of perpetuating the worst possible uh, stereotypes about, for example, the black male rapist, for example, and we see that being replicated in some ways today against trans women. Um, th this idea of, of women needing protecting, the, this image of the woman who's been gagged. And then I think about this image and I connect it to the gender critical images of, of trans women oppressing women. Um, there are very powerful connections, I think. Um, and yeah, I, I, the brilliant journalist Ash Sarkar, for example, says, um, there is a media interest, and I quote, in utilizing feminism and discourses that develop through feminism about sexual harassment and sexual abuse and wielding them to demonize transgender people. And, and this strategizing as well of, of being silenced by this disempowered trans community that has pretty much no power in relation to the media. Um, Sarah Ahmed, whose work has already been quoted today in the, in the um, conference, whenever people keep being given a platform to say they have no platform, or whenever people speak endlessly about being silenced, you not only have a performative contradiction, you are witnessing a mechanism of power. So these mechanisms of power, um, the, the media studies academic, trans uh, media studies academic in the United States, Thomas Billard talks a lot about basically the gender critical discourse being one of disinformation spreading stigmatizing misinformation about trans people as the, the groomer narratives, the predator narratives, the contagion narratives, 
Um, it's very difficult to deal with this when simultaneously it's all about being labeled as women's rights issues. Um, and that brings me to Adult Human Female, a documentary that came out recently. And um, well, to, to give you like a lowdown, I'm just going to read some of the notes that I've written. Um, Edinburgh Academics for Academic Freedom, which is like a small group of gender critical activists in the staff of Edinburgh University, they attempted in December 2022 and April 23 to host a screening and accompanying panel event at the University of Edinburgh with this film. Both screenings were cancelled after direct action protests. And I should say, there were a lot of protests. So academics, you know, like staff and students, um, UCU, so the Union of Co Colleges and Universities, all tried to intervene and say, this film is disgusting. It's, it's clearly anti-trans propaganda, th these kind of polemics that just consistently portray trans people in a very stigmatized way. This is not academic work. But the, the senior management said, yeah, yeah, academic freedom, we must, we must be allowed to hear um, speech, even if it's hate speech. Um, so the film is promoted as being about women's rights, which I think is another strategic uh, device used by the gender critical movement to really spread hate by saying this isn't about trans, this is about women's rights. Um, the promotion does not reference its focus on trans people. So over 90 minutes, it draws on the opinions of similar-minded anti-trans campaigners who confidently offer disparaging evidence-free opinions about trans people being violent, delusional perverts. And I should be specific, trans women as violent, delusional perverts. I'm gonna give you some examples in a minute. Um, five minutes, there are, five sorry? Minutes. Five minutes oh. together, there are no trans people or even allies interviewed in this documentary. And so to give you, oh, sorry, there we go. Um, to give you some images. So in one point, Jane Claire Jones, the gender critical philosopher, she talks about the connection between trans women and sexual perversion with fetishism. Um, she simply make, seems to make up facts. She doesn't cite any of it. And then there's an image of an actor we assume is naked wearing women's gloves who seems to be sexually aroused. And that's the supporting evidence of the documentary. Other images include, um, again, actors dressed up as like SAS, style people, militaristic marching menacingly towards the camera. Um, when it talks about trans activism in this very distilled image of trans activism is inherently violent. Um, and in another uh, section of the film, we have um, talk about how trans identity is inherently delusional um, with this image of the wizard by the sea, just uh, all living in a fantasy land. And there are lots of ambiguously given or, or simply misleading information about prisons, about the fact that women's prisons are filled with dangerous predatory trans women, when in fact the Equality Act prohibits that. Um, so there's a lot of misinformation basically. Um, other things that are really um, hurtful and offensive, I think, are some of the comments regarding, for example, trans is a, a luxury belief, as Lucy uh, Massoud says, um, or Simon Edge saying, I go back five or six years before trans was even a thing. I mean, this total lack of knowledge about the history of trans identity. And um, it's all a bit crazy, it's all a bit daft, and, and young people are just becoming trans because it's cool, or, or it's um, the, the pressure on gays and young gays and lesbians to transition to become trans. So this misinformation, I mean, if you look at, at some of the facts, for example, just to highlight the fact, the absence of, of these things from, from the documentary, according to the official, to the Office of National Statistics, in 2021, more Britons than ever identify as lesbian, gay, or bisexual. So it totally underscores, the actual data and just um, kind of undermines any of these claims about young people being pressurized, pressurized in the gay and lesbian community into becoming trans. Um, also data on the, the spike, uh, the, certainly the increase in hate crime against young trans people. And of course, then there was the murder of Brianna Jai just earlier this year. So this idea that trans people get it easy is extremely offensive. Um, and that brings me to just the, the, the issue as well that we have with this kind of documentary being shown, shown in universities. Farhana Sultan talks about how Free speech makes no distinction about quality. Academic freedom does. Academic freedom is not about spreading random ideas or opinions about the pursuit of truth. The construction and dissemination of knowledge that is clearly grounded in academic scholarship and which meets a basic level of intellectual rigor. Adult human female simply doesn't 
um, meet those standards. So it shouldn't be used in the same way that um, birth of a nation was used basically as a recruiting tool or as a, a tool to stigmatize against a, a vulnerable minority. And thinking about this free speech absolutism is a very ideological position. It's not a, uni a natural university third sector position at all. If we look at the organizations that push for free speech um, in an absolute way, it's, it's organizations like the, the Conservative Heritage Foundation, which is anti-LGBT, anti-feminist, and uses this free speech as cover for, for basically hate speech. Meanwhile, you have Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which emphasizes the need for balance between freedom of speech and uh, limits and responsibilities, which Edinburgh University is forsaking um, at the moment. And that brings me just to the final point. So Edinburgh University has a dignity and respect policy. And if I just read the part in bold, it says, the university is for promoting a positive culture which celebrates difference, challenges prejudice and ensures fairness and supports freedom of thought and expression within the law and within a framework of respect for the rights of other people. Adult human female uh, just presents trans women as violent, delusional perverts. It does so with no data. It does so um, in ways which are almost mocking and sarcastic. In no way does the university meet this criteria of protecting minorities, including the trans minority. And it just brings me to my final point, which is there can be no dignity and respect or anti-discrimination policies when you have this new form of ideological free speech absolutism. Um, it's incompatible and universities have to be challenged on this um, in order to protect the trans community among other communities against hate speech. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you um, if, if I could ask if you could let us have those slides at some time and then we'll disseminate them with the rest of the materials uh, at a time, some point in the future. Um, Jane or Ada, if you can uh, join us, please. We're going to move from the, slightly from the academic debate. And once again, Gina picking up on that, that wider point, just as Katie did um, and Richard Jack did this morning about the wider points about the, the political society, the economics, the general fear that's running through society with trans people at the moment. Um, we're just waiting for uh, Orlando and Jay to join us to discuss. Their... Okay, we're becoming. Okay. <laughs> you can't escape the owl. <laughs> oh, okay. Where would you like to sit? Sit. And they're going to discuss experiences uh, and some some uh, context of their chapter that was written between them recently. And after that, Gina, if we can ask you to hang on and for everybody else to join us for a Q&A session before we wrap up. Thank you. So we're going to go a little bit left field because we said we're going to discuss Jay's experiences and I've had the pleasure of working with Jay for a, oh, okay. I've had the pleasure of working with Jay to put together his story for a book chapter. But I've listened really interestingly today to what everybody said and I think we're going to do something slightly different. And the reason for that is I'd like to end on a bit more upbeat in, in a way that we've heard some really hard stories and hard stuff. We've talked about structural narrative and how everything is very transphobic. So we're going to talk a little bit. Well, Jay doesn't know this yet, though, so no, that's really, that. really fun for him. No. But what I'm, I think might be interesting is Jay, not only does he work with us on our book chapter, but he also works with our students. And he does a lot of work as does our other Jay colleague over there with our students. So what I thought I would do, if it's okay with everybody and Jay, is ask him a bit about that. So you can see what he's trying to do through his activism, because actually the work you do with our students is very much activism, isn't it? And just to let you know, I'm a social worker. So the students he works with for me are social workers, and they, they have an awful lot to learn. And you also work with um, do um, humanization workshops, which is the yeah. nurse students, and um, I don't like that. Um, so, um, you you just so, who do you? Why do you work with our students? To make a positive difference, because I know when I came out, there were no other trans men out. There was no information or anything like that. And I was only two thousand and seven. Sorry. Um, yeah, just completely confused. It's all right. Tell us a bit more about why you work with students. Yeah, I think getting people when they're quite young, it's really good. You get them at the bottom, 
it's going to go upwards. Hopefully, we're giving them empowering them enough to challenge anything they come across. Um, I get quite a lot out of it, as does the other day, because we're doing something positive for the trans community. And I don't know, so I have passing privilege. I think Jay has passing privilege. We don't necessarily be deemed as trans people. And then when people find out that I was born female, they're just like, what, eh, what? You can teach at that moment. That's the moment where they take a step back and they're like, oh my God, right? Okay, this is a bit different. Put them on the spot and see what happens. But I think out of five or six years, there's only been one student that didn't really kick in with us. And that's not bad going really. Because we did it over COVID as well. So it was in that was never done a Zoom before, and all of a sudden doing a Zoom session. Like, Faces coming from everywhere. But yeah, it's doing something positive. So doing when you else you do it, when you walk in that room for the first time and they meet you, how do you how do you find them? What are they like? Confused. <laughs> <laughs> They're mostly confused to be fair, because nobody can believe that I was born female. But again, that is the bit where you can teach people. People, they got presumed I was uh, the male in my life, and I'm like, but no, I'm not, I'm not male, but I'm not female, but I'm kind of a mixture of the both, and that's all right to be like that. And I think a lot of trans people go to the extreme to then come back again, and most of us come back in again. There's a few that stay on the outsides, but they're the more shouty people. But we want to be more stealth, like, we want to just be treated like normal people. And that's, in essence, what's going on. We're not being treated as human beings at the moment. We're just informed by the government and it's hiding other sneaky stuff that they're doing behind us. Meanwhile, all the trans people are getting hung out to dry. Um, you've got a generation of young people that have felt safe to come out. What are they going to do now? The schools have got to add them to their parents if they you know, use pronouns at school and stuff. Because I was reading it yesterday. Oh, my God. How backwards are we going to go? I'm even nervous. I'm out as out as anyone is really. I'm actually thinking of reining it back in a little bit because I'm getting nervous. So I'm going to get my head kicked in at some point, and that's by a cis guy. So therefore, I'm probably going to be beaten up because I can't. I'm not as strong. But yeah, sorry. Went well, sideways around here a little bit. That's okay. So what parts of your story, and you can share any bit that you think is relevant, impact the students the most in their learning? Oh, what, what impacts them the most? In your story? Um, I don't know. I just think people can't get their heads around that I was born female. <laughs> and that is where a lot of it comes from. But what examples do they really pick up on? I'm thinking of, you know, maybe your mum and her reactions. Or your operations. Oh God, don't talk about operations. <laughs> I can't talk about operations because um, I'm up to number 12 for my lower surgery at the moment, and that's next month. And that kind of says that it's not quite as good as what it should be. But again, you're waiting years for this kind of stuff. I started my lower surgery journey in 2013, and I'm still going through it now over 10 years going through the system. Oh, but it's easy to be trans. You'll be in and out of the system in 20 minutes. No, no, no. I came out in 2007 and I'm still stuck in the system. I've been in the surgery system since 2010. You know, I had three top surgeries because my drain's blocked, I've hysterectomy. I've had 11 surgeries now, soon to be 12. That means I'm gonna have 15 surgeries by the time I finished. Oh, well, I didn't sign up for this. You know, they, they just say, oh, one in 10 people we will be bad for. The nine out of 10 people, they'll be absolutely fine. No, 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 it's the other way around. You've got one person that's right, okay, and nine people that aren't. And I find that quite difficult to deal with. And what stigma did you find when you were in the working with that in that system, and you're still in that system? Um, I don't feel that I get taken seriously. I don't feel that like I've recently got an autism diagnosis. And they sort of go hand in hand with the trans thing, but people aren't taking my autism seriously now. And it's just like all the pieces are slotting into place here, but like my mum, she still can't handle it. And it's like, but no, I've not been transitioning since 2007. Come on. But I'm realizing that I actually think my mum is a little bit transphobic. 
which is quite weird because both my parents are psychiatric nurses. They should know better, you know what I mean? I just gave them a of paperwork and told them to read it right away. But it's, yeah, parents, they're so hard. You want their approval, but they don't accept who you. You are now. And I think when I'm struggling with that a little bit, because I'm not the little girl that was running around. I didn't come out till I was 32. So for her, I was her daughter for what, 32 years. How do you break that? How do you change that? And then my mum went and got breast cancer and I wanted top surgery. And it was like, well, hey, you know, unfortunately my little sister passed away when I was eight. So my mum's always done that. You're my only daughter left kind of pressure. And that's just for my mum. Again, on this pressure. But how do you deal with society when you can't even get your parents to agree? You know, it's like the same family day. I'd tip up there one week doing voluntary stuff, obviously. And I turned out in my brother's calm peers. And my, my niece is now my nephew, which is weird. So my mum's gone off on one totally. I'm trying to be there for the young person. My brother doesn't get it because he doesn't even acknowledge it really. And I'm just thinking this poor is at the dean. I need to look after this young person, but I can't be seen as an influence because they need to work this, themselves out. But it's trying to give them a space, safe space. And I think that's literally what sort of this space is all about. Give them that time and place. We've had people come into group that were like, yeah, I'm this, I'm this, I'm this. A year later, actually, I don't quite fit that. I'm more like this now. And we're trying to say, but you're still part of the community, you know? You don't get rejected because you don't identify as A, B, and C. You know, trans people, we all know deep down that we're trans whenever most of us do. I'd say 95% of us. That's ridiculous. And now they're banning this stuff in school. And it's like, how can you do that when we're all saying that we knew when we were young? Why aren't you listening to these young people? So that's my final question, because I've just had the warning in terms of time, and I know how you talk, Jay. Uh, <laughs> <I just laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what about everything that we've heard today and society and this kind of the stigma that you live in the world that you live in, all of these stories, all of this stuff, what does impacts that have on you? The police haven't made me feel any better about the situation. Mm -hmm. And basically, I'm a little bit upset that they're not still in here because mm -hmm. they need to hear the real life stuff. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's, it's a whole being that is being discussed and put on the table. Nobody else's identity has been put on the table to be discussed mm -hmm. and picked apart mm -hmm. for this, that, and the other. If people can just be themselves, I don't know what it's like to be myself because I. I've got no rules, there's no boundaries, there's no anything. But then, why do you have to pigeonhole yourself? I spent my whole life looking for somewhere because I didn't get anywhere. I found the trans thing, I was like, oh, excellent, that's really good. But actually, that's just me. I don't have, I'm just Jay. People don't get that. And it's so frustrating. But again, <laughs> that's when you keep people. And what would you like people to take away from your talk today? Treat people how you wish to be treated, I think. You know, everyone's a human being, ultimately. We're all different. <laughs> and how can not all trans people are the same? We don't all want the same thing. But then a lot of us do want the same thing. So it's like any community. You're going to have splits and stuff. But it, take us seriously. What we, we know how we feel. And in essence, that's, that's it, really. All right. Thank you. Away now. Yes. <laughs>